Good morning, everyone. The 9,010th meeting of the Security Council is called to order. I give the floor to the Russian Federation. Madam President, before we adopt the agenda, I'd like to express our protest in connection with the fact that the just started uh, British presidency uh, dealt with our two requests to convene a security council in connection with the horrific provocation of the Ukrainian forces in Bucha. Now, from the beginning of the first meeting, which we requested on the third, Sunday, 3rd of April, for Monday at 3 p.m., and then an emergency meeting, which we requested uh, at 12 o'clock on the 4th of April, after you refused our first request. We considered that it was, you considered that it was possible to blatantly uh, uh, violate the rules of the council, uh, and for the second time uh, issue a, a decision that wasn't coordinated with anyone that it would be better to discuss this topic today. This is uh, an outrageous situation uh, uh, set out in my letter to you yesterday as an official document of the council. I would like to ask you, on what basis uh, do you feel that you can act in such an outrageous way uh, in the contravention of all uh, existing norms and rules? Don't you know that, that in case you don't agree with our proposal, you should have convened a meeting and put forward the issue of the advisability of holding a meeting or a vote, especially since you should have uh, had before you the example of our presidency where we didn't refuse a single time to convene any of the six meetings on Ukraine. We demand an explanation uh, from you, and we hope that in the future you will not challenge the, the right of members of the Security Council to request uh, a meeting uh, enshrined in Rule 2. call a meeting of the Security Council at the request of any member of the Security Council. Thank you. I thank the representative of the Russian Federation. Is there anyone else who wants to comment on this? I will uh, explain uh, the presidency's position in just a moment. Okay. Uh, if I could um, respond to your points uh, from the Russian Federation, we did uh, not reject your request for a meeting. We received your letter uh, on Sunday and it is the responsibility, with the obligation of the presidency to uh, schedule a meeting. Uh, you particularly requested a meeting for a time on Monday. Uh, our proposal as presidency was to schedule the meeting either alongside the meeting today, so well within the 48-hour limit, uh, which is the convention of the Security Council, uh, or to hold the meetings sequentially, one after the other. Uh, and I understand that the Russian Federation turn down both proposals, but I wish to be clear that we did not uh, reject the request for a meeting. The deferral proposed was uh, less than 24 hours, uh, and uh, to be clear, uh, we share the view that this is an urgent situation, uh, and we have, as I say, offered the Russian Federation either a separate meeting today or to combine it with this one. And so, as far as the presidency is concerned, uh, we did uh, everything in line with the provisional rules of procedure uh, and with precedent. We have received no other complaints from council members on the subject. I give the floor to the Russian Federation. Thank you. We have evidence, factual evidence, that this was no less than 24 hours before the meeting that we requested. 
Это все зафиксировано документально. Is, uh, если это кому-то интересно, я хочу выразить надежду, что то, что вы сейчас сказали, означает, что вы не будете впредь отказывать странам-члена Совета Безопасности когда они это запросят. Спасибо. I thank the representative of the Russian Federation. Uh, the presidency will not refuse to host meetings uh, in the future, uh, and I hope that that now closes that point, and we can proceed with the adoption of the agenda. The provisional agenda for this meeting is letter dated the 28th of February 2014 from the permanent representative of Ukraine to the United Nations addressed to the President of the Security Council, S slash 2014 slash 136. The agenda is adopted. <clears throat> I should like to start by taking the opportunity to pay tribute on behalf of this Council uh, to Her Excellency Lana Naseba, the permanent representative of the United Arab Emirates. Uh, for your service as the President of the Council for the month of March. Uh, I'm sure I speak for all of us in expressing our deep appreciation to Ambassador Nasaba and her team for the skillful uh, conduct of the Council's business last month. Thank you very much indeed to your team. In accordance with Rule 37 of the Council's Provisional Rules of Procedure, I invite the representative of Ukraine to participate in this meeting. It is so decided. On behalf of the Council, I welcome the participation of His Excellency Mr. Volodymyr Zelensky, the President of Ukraine, and just add that as usual precedent, the permanent representative of Ukraine will also join the meeting uh, in case of any technical issues. In accordance with Rule 39 of the Council's Provisional Rules of Procedure, I invite the following briefers to participate in this meeting. Ms. Rosemary De Carlo, Under Secretary General for Political and Peacebuilding Affairs, and Mr. Martin Griffiths, Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs, Emergency Relief Coordinator. It is so decided. In accordance with Rule 39 of the Council's Provisional Rules of Procedure, I also invite His Excellency Mr. Olof Skoog, Head of Delegation of the European Union to the United Nations, to participate in this meeting. It is so decided. The Security Council will now begin its consideration of item two of the agenda. I wish to warmly welcome His Excellency the Secretary-General, His Excellency Mr. Antonio Guterres, and I give him the floor. Madam President, Excellencies, the war in Ukraine is one of the greatest challenges ever to the international order and the global peace architecture founded on the United Nations Charter because of its nature, intensity and consequences. We are dealing with the full-fledged invasion on several fronts of one member state of the United Nations, Ukraine, by another, the Russian Federation, a permanent member of the Security Council, in violation of the United Nations Charter and with several aims, including redrawing the international recognized borders between the two countries. The war has led to senseless loss of life, massive devastation in urban centers, and the destruction of civilian infrastructure. I will never forget the horrifying images of civilians killed in Butcher, and I immediately called for an independent investigation to guarantee effective accountability. And I'm also deeply shocked by the personal testimony of rapes and sexual violence that now are emerging. The High Commissioner for Human Rights has spoken of possible war crimes, grave breaches of international humanitarian law, and serious violations of international human rights law. 
And the Russian offensive has also led to the displacement of more than 10 million people in just one month, the fastest forced population movement since the Second World War. Far beyond Ukraine's borders, the war has led to massive increases in, its pri in prices of food, energy and fertilizers because Russia and Ukraine are linchpins of these markets. It has disrupted supply chains and increased the cost of transportation, putting even more pressure on the developing world. Many developing countries are already on the verge of debt collapse due to the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and the lack of adequate liquidity and debt relief, stemming ultimately from the unfair nature of our global economic and financial system. For all these reasons, it is more urgent by the day to silence the guns. That is why I ask the Emergency Relief Coordinator, Martin Griffiths, to travel to Russia and Ukraine to press for an urgent humanitarian ceasefire. And the Secretary General Griffiths will update you on the humanitarian situation and the results of his contacts so far. And the Secretary General Di Carlo will also brief you on the political and human rights dimensions. But as Secretary General of the United Nations, it is my duty to call the attention of the Council to the serious damage being done to the global economy and particularly to vulnerable people and developing countries. Madam President, our analysis indicates that 74 developing countries with a total population of 1.2 billion people are particularly vulnerable to spiking food, energy and fertilizer costs. Debt obligations take up some 16% of developing countries' export earnings, and in small island developing states, the figure is 34% and rising because of increased interest rates and the need to pay for expensive imports. In the past months alone, wheat prices have increased by 22%, maize by 21%, and barley by 31%. Brent oil prices on the 1st of April were more than 60% higher than at the same time last year. A series of events have led to that, not only the present situation. Natural gas and fertilizer prices more than double over the same period. We are already seeing some countries move from vulnerability into crisis and signs of serious social unrest. The flames of conflict are fueled by inequality, deprivation and underfunding. With all the warning signals flashing red, we have a duty to act. Madam President, the Global Crisis Response Group on Food, Energy and Finance that I set up last month has formulated some initial recommendations for the consideration of member states, international financial institutions and others. On food, we are urging all countries to keep markets open, resist unjustified and unnecessary export restrictions, and make reserves available to countries at risk of hunger and famine. This is not a time for protectionism. Humanitarian appeals must be fully funded. People cop up in crises around the world cannot pay the price for this war. Our, on energy, the use of strategic stockpiles and additional reserves could help ease this energy crisis in the short term. But the only medium and long-term solution is to accelerate the deployment of renewable energy which is not impacted by market fluctuations. These will allow the progressive phase-out of coal and other fossil fuels, and renewables are already cheaper in most of the cases. And on finance, international financial institutions must go into emergency mode. We need urgent action by the G20 and international financial institutions to increase liquidity and fiscal space so that governments can provide safety nets for the poorest and most vulnerable. The reform I've been calling for the global financial system is long overdue. All these actions are closely linked with the prevention agenda and with building and sustaining peace. Madam President, the war in Ukraine must stop now. We need serious negotiations for peace based on the principles of the United Nations Charter. This Council is charged with maintaining peace and doing so in solidarity. I deeply regret the divisions that have prevented the Security Council from acting not only on Ukraine, but on other threats to peace and security around the world. I urge the Council to do everything in its power to end the war and to mitigate its impact, both on the suffering people of Ukraine and on vulnerable people and developing countries around the world. And I thank you. I thank the Secretary General for his remarks. I now give the floor to Ms. Rosemary DiCarlo. Thank you.
Madam President, since I last briefed this Council on 17 March, the security situation in Ukraine has seriously deteriorated. The number of Ukrainian civilians killed has more than doubled. Ukrainian cities continue to be mercilessly pounded, often indiscriminately, by heavy artillery and aerial bombardments. And hundreds of thousands of people, including children, the elderly, and the disabled, remain trapped in encircled areas under nightmarish conditions. The devastation wrought on Mariupol and other Ukrainian cities, cities, cities is one of the shameful hallmarks of this senseless war. The horror deepened this past weekend as shocking images emerged of dead civilians, some with hands bound, lying in the streets of Bucha, the town near Kiev formerly held by Russian forces. Many bodies were also found in a mass grave in the same locality. Reports by non-governmental organizations and media also allege summary executions of civilians, rape and looting in Chernihiv, Kharkiv, and Kiev regions. Madam President, away from the fighting, diplomatic efforts to end this war, including direct talks between Ukrainian and Russian representatives, have continued. We commend the government of Turkey for hosting these discussions, as well as the efforts of many others engaging with Russia and Ukraine to help bring about peace. We welcome the willingness of the sides to continue engaging to reach a mutual understanding. This requires good faith and earnest efforts, and progress in the negotiations should be translated quickly into action on the ground. While there has been a reported reduction of Russian troops in attacks around Kyiv and Chernihiv, such moves should not be merely tactical, repositioning forces for renewed attacks on Ukrainian cities and towns elsewhere. The General Assembly has twice called for Russian forces to withdraw entirely from Ukrainian territory and cease all military operations. We also take note of the reported withdrawal of Russian forces from around the Chernobyl nuclear site. The International Atomic Energy Agency reports that this development will hopefully allow it to conduct an assistance and support mission to provide technical advice and to deliver equipment where necessary as soon as possible. All nuclear sites in Ukraine must be fully protected and secured. Military operations in or around these locations must be avoided. Madam President, the numbers tell a tragic, if yet incomplete, story. According to the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, at least 1,480 civilians have been killed and at least 2,195 injured between 24 February and 4 April 2022. OHCHR believes that the actual figures are considerably higher. We are gravely concerned by the persistent use of explosive weapons with the wide impact area in or near populated areas. Such weapons are causing most civilian casualties as well as massive destruction of civilian infrastructure, including residential buildings, hospitals, schools, water stations, and electricity systems. OHCHR has received credible allegations that Russian forces have used cluster munitions in populated areas at least 24 times. Allegations that Ukrainian forces have used such weapons are also being investigated. As noted by the High Commissioner, indiscriminate attacks are prohibited under international humanitarian law and may amount to war crimes. The massive destruction of civilian objects and the high number of civilian casualties strongly indicate that the fundamental principles of distinction, proportionality, and precaution have not been sufficiently adhered to. In besieged cities, a significant increase in mortality rates among civilians can also be attributed to the disruption of medical care and basic services. People with disabilities and the elderly are particularly vulnerable. As of 4 April 2022, the World Health Organization has reported a total of 85 attacks on healthcare facilities, resulting in at least 72 fatalities and 43 injuries. 
Madam President, we are seriously concerned about reports of cases of arbitrary arrests and enforced disappearances of persons who have been vocal against the Russian invasion. As of 30 March, OHCHR has documented the arbitrary detention and possible enforced disappearance of 22 journalists and civil society members in Kiev, Kherson, Luhansk, and Zaporizhia regions. 24 local officials have also been detained in regions under Russian control, 13 of whom have been subsequently released. We call for the immediate release of all individuals who have been arbitrarily detained, including journalists, local officials, civil society activists, and others. Also, as of 30 March, OHCHR has recorded seven journalists and media workers killed since hostilities began. Another 15 have come, un come under armed attack, nine of whom were injured. Allegations of conflict-related sexual violence perpetrated by Russian forces have also emerged. These include gang rape and rapes in front of children. There are also claims of sexual violence by Ukrainian forces and civil defense militias. The UN Human Rights Monitoring Mission in Ukraine continues to seek to verify all these allegations. We're also concerned about disturbing videos depicting abuse of prisoners of war on both sides. All prisoners of war must be treated with dignity and full respect for their rights in accordance with international humanitarian law. Madam President, the many credible allegations of serious violations of international humanitarian law and international human rights law from areas recently retaken from Russian forces must not go unanswered. We support efforts to examine these allegations and to gather evidence. Ensuring accountability and justice for acts committed during the war will not be easy, but it is essential. Madam President, we are heartened by the generosity of neighboring countries who have accepted millions of refugees and the solidarity of the Ukrainian people who are hosting their displaced compatriots. <clears throat> With more than 10 million people displaced, either within Ukraine or abroad as refugees, roughly one quarter of the population, the United Nations is gravely concerned about the heightened risk of human trafficking. Indeed, suspected and verified cases of human trafficking are surfacing in the surrounding countries, according to the International Organization for Migration. Madam President, this war is devastating Ukraine now, but it also threatens its future. Early assessment projections by UNDP suggest that if the war continues through 2022, Ukraine faces the prospect of seeing 18 years of socioeconomic progress lost. This would set the country and the region back decades and leave deep long-term social and economic fissures. UN agencies, including UNDP, are working to help preserve Ukraine's hard-worn development gains. This involves supporting the government to sustain essential government structures and basic services, including emergency measures to sustain livelihoods, such as cash-based assistance. Madam President, the war in Ukraine has damaged Europe's security architecture. Its economic repercussions are already evident far from the battlefield. The longer the war continues, the greater the risk that it will further weaken the global institutions and mechanisms dedicated to preserve peace and security. The war was started by choice. There is no inevitability to it or to the suffering it is causing. The United Nations is ready to do everything within its means to help bring an end to it. Thank you, Madam President. I thank Mr. Carlo for her briefing. And I now give the floor to uh, Mr. Martin Griffiths. Thank you, Madam President. Um, as you've just heard from the Secretary General and Under Secretary General Di Carlo, Ukrainian civilians are paying far too high a price for this war. I want to speak briefly about humanitarian needs and what we're doing to meet them before I then uh, refer to my recent travels. In the last six weeks, as we have heard, at least 1,430 people have been killed, among them over 121 children. And we know this is 
very likely a serious underestimate. Homes and civilian infrastructure bridges, hospitals, schools have been damaged and destroyed. And in fact, the current figures on displacement tell us that more than 11.3 million people have now been forced to flee their homes. And of that, 4.2 million are now refugees in those generous neighboring countries that Rosemary has just been referring to. So in total, more than a quarter of the population of Ukraine has fled in this extraordinary short time. And unfortunately, we can imagine that these figures will continue to rise until we can find a pause and some peace. Madam President, the ground and air offensives and counter offensives are making life nearly impossible for many civilians in Ukraine. Families, the elderly, women and children have been trapped by fighting already for too long. For more than five weeks, the people of Mariupol have been caught up in the fighting. And it is well documented that really Mariupol is a center of hell. Other cities like Chernihiv, Sumy and Kharkiv remain cut off from essential goods and services. And perilous conditions are hampering our efforts to access civilians or for them to access us. And we restate here that civilians must be allowed to move to safer areas without the fear of attacks and at their own choice and at their own selection. It's vital that all parties uh, to the conflict respect their obligations under international humanitarian law to protect civilians and to allow impartial humanitarian organizations safe rapid, unimpeded access to all civilians in need, wherever they are in Ukraine. Madam President, as the world watches humanitarian needs soar in Ukraine, the United Nations and our partner organizations are making every effort to dramatically increase our support to affected civilians. The work of the 6,000 volunteers from the Ukraine Red Cross, as we have noted before in this chamber, Together with local NGOs in eastern Ukraine, these people, these organizations continue to work tireless, tirelessly at the front line of assistance to communities. The World Food Programme has reached more than 1.3 million people with cash and food assistance and plans to push that number up to 2.5 million people in this month. Health Partners report that more than 180 tons of medical supplies were delivered in Ukraine, with another 470 tons on the way. And this will address the health needs of about 6 million people in the months ahead. And I'm pleased to say, that seems an odd word to say in the context of Ukraine, that after much effort in the past day, another convoy went from our humanitarian hub in Dnipro to the Far East. Today, food, winter clothing, non-food items, medicine, hygiene kits were offloaded to the Ukraine Red Cross and will reach the hands of those most in need. Indeed, following notification to both parties, a formal process that we and also the International Red Cross are engaged in, four convoys in total from the UN have provided critical support to people in some of the cities encircled by war. We're on with and, it, and affected by ongoing fighting. Several more are planned. So these are initial steps, but it gives us a basis to now expand and taking our efforts up to scale and expanding much more than one convoy a day. As the Secretary General and the Under Secretary General has already said, I want to also join them in expressing my concern over the growing number of reports we receive of human trafficking sexual violence, exploitation, and abuse in Ukraine and in the region. And as ever, such horrific incidents as we're seeing, they overwhelmingly impact displaced women and children more than others. We're bolstering protection and gender-based violence services through agencies to provide specialized care for survivors and through the, 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 the wealth of civil society organizations in Ukraine. These services are designed, carried out directly in collaboration with and through Ukrainian civil society, including very particularly 
women-led organizations. Madam President, today I'm addressing you from Geneva, having just returned from Moscow overnight. As you know, the Secretary General, as he said, charged me to bring both sides together on humanitarian grounds to explore both specific and sustained ways to reduce humanitarian suffering, including in particular uh, inter alia, but in particular the pursuit of a humanitarian ceasefire. Yesterday in Moscow, I had long and frank exchanges with the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Sergei Lavrov, and his deputy, Sergei Brashinin, and then separately with Alexander Fomin, the Deputy Minister of Defense. In my meetings with these senior officials, I discussed also, in addition to these possibilities of humanitarian ceasefires, I discussed the issue of humanitarian convoys of safe passage, including the four which we've, I've already referred to. I outlined possibilities for building further on that cooperation, sharing specific suggestions for mutually agreed upon military freezes to allow for evacuation of civilians and for the safe passage of life-saving aid, in effect for humanitarian pauses in different parts of Ukraine to save lives and bring back a modicum of safety for those living in those places. My counterparts in Moscow received these suggestions, assured me of their intent to carefully study those ideas, which I left with them. And we agreed to remain in close contact. And I came away from these meetings, believing that we have a very long road, a long road ahead of us, but it must be traveled. And Madam President, we will travel it. Tomorrow, I hope to travel, I plan to travel to Ukraine, to have discussions with senior authorities from the Ukrainian government in Kyiv on Thursday on these same issues and others that they will no doubt present to me. And also to see firsthand with our crisis coordinator, Amin Awad, the humanitarian response. Madam President, thanks to generous donor contributions. Madam President, thanks to generous donor contributions, many from governments in this chamber, the humanitarian response since February has indeed been scaled up, allowing us to meet the needs of one and a half million people. We will need sustained financial support for needs in Ukraine. And like the Secretary General, I want to stress, as he has done consistently, that funding must not be diverted from other crises. And Madam President, for Afghanistan, and that is one example. As you heard from David Beasley last week, conflict, climate shocks, COVID, compounded by the soaring food and fuel costs uh, indicated by the Secretary General, could push another 47 million people globally into severe food insecurity. And so the total number of people around the world who will not know where their next meal comes from could be driven to the astonishing figure of 325 million people around the world. That is by a long distance the highest in our recent history and well over double what was what it was three years ago. So Madam President, I close of course, like others, by reminding the Council of what the Council already knows well. The world cannot afford this war and neither can the people of Ukraine. And like others, I call on all council members and member states with influence to support all efforts from whatever part they come from in the pursuit of peace and the alleviation of humanitarian suffering for the sake of the people of Ukraine, for the sake of those around the world who cannot afford to bear the additional burden this war imposes on them and all of us. We must, as the Secretary General said, silence the guns. Thank you, Madam President. I thank Mr. Griffiths for his briefing. I now give the floor to His Excellency Mr. Volodymyr Zelensky, the President of Ukraine. You have the floor, sir. Thank you very much, dear Madam Chairman. 
Dear Mr. Secretary General, distinguished members of the Security Council and other members of this meeting, thank you very much for this opportunity. I'm sure that all the representatives of the United Nations member states will hear me today. Yesterday, I returned from our city of Bucha, recently liberated from Russian troops, not far from here. So there is not a single crime that they would not commit there. The Russian military search for and purposefully killed anyone who served our country. They killed, shot and killed women outside their houses when they just tried to call someone who is alive. They killed entire families, adults and children, and they tried to burn the bodies. I am addressing you on behalf of the people who honor the memory of the deceased every single day in the memory of the civilians who died, who were shot, who killed in the back of their head after being tortured. Some of them were shot on the streets, others were thrown into the wells, so they died there in suffering. They were killed in their apartments, houses, blowing up grenades. The civilians were crushed by tanks while sitting in the, their cars in the middle of the road just for their pleasure. They cut off uh, uh, limbs, cut their throats, slashed their throats. Women were raped and killed in front of their children. They were, uh, their tongues were pulled out only because the aggressor did not hear what they wanted to hear from them. So this is no different from other ter terrorists such as Daesh who occupied some territories. And here it is done by a, a member of the United Nations Security Council destroying internal uh, unity borders, countries, and uh, taking uh, the right of more than a dozen uh, countries who are uh, self-determined and independent. They pursued consistent policy of destroying ethnic and religious diversity. They inflame wars and deliberately lead them in uh, such a way that to kill as many uh, regular civilians and cities to leave the country where they deploy their troops in ruins and filled with mass graves. You all see that. And they support hatred at the level of the state and seek to export it to other countries through their system of propaganda and political corruption. They provoke a global food crisis that could lead to famine in Africa Asia uh, and other countries and will uh, surely end in large-scale political chaos in many countries where to, and uh, destroying their domestic security. So where is the security that the Security Council needs to guarantee? It's not there, although there is a Security Council. And, uh, so where is the peace? Where, where, where are those guarantees that the United Nations needs to guarantee? It is obvious that the key institution of the world, which must ensure uh, the coercion of any aggressor to peace, simply cannot work. Effectively. Now the world can see that the Russian what Russian military did in Bucha while keeping the city under their occupation, but the world has yet to see what they have done in other occupied cities and regions of our country. Geography might be different or various, but cruelty is the same, crimes are the same, and accountability must be inevitable. Ladies and gentlemen, Gentlemen, I would like to remind you of Article 1, Chapter 1 of the UN Charter. What is the purpose of our organization? It's uh, purpose is to maintain peace and uh, make sure that uh, peace is adhered to. And now the UN Charter is violated literally, starting with the Article 1. And if so, what is the point of all other articles? Today, as a result of Russia's actions in our country, uh, in Ukraine, the most terrible war crimes of all times are uh, we see uh, since the end of World War II, and they are being committed. Russians Troops are deliberately destroying Ukrainian cities uh, to ashes by with artillery and airstrike. They are deliberately blocking cities, creating mass starvation. They deliberately shoot columns of civilians on the road trying to escape from the territory of hostilities. 
they even deliberately blow up shelters where civilians hide from air strikes. They are deliberately creating conditions in the temporarily occupied territories so that as many civilians as possible are killed there. Uh, the massacre in our city of Bucha is only one, unfortunately, only one of many examples of what the occupiers have been doing on our land for the past 41 days. And there are many more cities, similar places where the world has yet to learn the full truth. Mariupol, Kharkiv, Chernobyl, Tirka, Borodyanka, and dozens of other Ukrainian communities, each of them is similar to Bucha. I know, and you know perfectly well what the representatives of Russia will say in response to the accusations of these crimes. They have said that many times. The most significant was after the shooting down of the Malaysian Boeing over Donbass by Russian forces with Russian weapons, or during the war in Syria. They will blame everyone just to justify their own actions. They will say that there are various uh, uh, versions, different versions, and it is impossible to establish which one of those versions is true. They will even say that the bodies were, uh, of those kills were allegedly thrown away, and all videos are staged. But it is 2022 now. We have conclusive evidence. So there are satellite images, uh, and we can conduct full and transparent investigations. That is what we are interested in. Maximum access for journalists, maximum cooperation with international institutions, involvement of the International Criminal Court, complete truth and full accountability. I'm sure that every uh, member state of the UN should be interested in this. For what? In order to push, punish once for, and for all those who consider themselves privileged and believe that they uh, can uh, get away with anything. So show all the other potential war criminals in the world how they will be punished. If the biggest one is punished, then everyone is punished. And why did Ukraine came to come to Ukraine? I will tell you, because Russia le Russia's leadership feels like colonizers in ancient times. They need our wealth, our people. Russia has already deported hundreds of thousands of our citizens to their country. They abducted more than 2,000 children, just simply conducted that, those children, and continue to do so. Russia wants to turn Ukraine into silent slaves. The Russian military are looting openly the cities and villages there. They have captured. This is wide-scale uh, looting. They are stealing everything, starting with food, uh, ending with earrings, gold earrings that are pulled out with blue, and covered with blood. We are dealing with a state that is turning the veto into the UN Security Council into the right to die. Uh, the, this undermines the whole architecture of uh, global security. It allows to, uh, them to go unpunished. So they are destroying everything that they can. So we, if this continues, the, uh, the countries will be rely only on the power of their own arms to ensure their security and not on international law, not rely on international institutions. The United Nations can be all simply closed. Ladies and gentlemen, are you ready to close the, the UN? Do you think that the time of international law is gone? If your answer is no, then you need to act immediately. The UN uh, charter must be restored immediately. The UN system must be reformed immediately so that the veto is not the right to die, that there is a fair representation in the Security Council of all regions of the world, the aggressor must be brought to peace immediately. The termination is needed. The massacre from Syria to Somalia, Somalia from Afghanistan to Yemen and Libya, that should have been stopped a long time ago, to tell you the truth. If tyranny had at least once received such a response to the war, it had been waged, it would 
have ceased to exist and honest peace had been guaranteed after it, and the world would have changed for sure. And then perhaps there would not be war in my country against our people, against Ukrainian people against uh, our citizens, but the world watched and did not want to see either the occupation of Crimea or the war against Georgia or taking the entire Transnistria from Moldova and how Russia was preparing uh, the basis for other conflicts and wars near their borders. How to stop it? Right away, the Russian military and those who gave them orders must be brought to justice immediately for war crimes in Ukraine. Anyone who has given criminal orders and carried out them by killing our people will be brought before the tribunal, which should be similar to the Nuremberg tribunal. I would like to remind Russian diplomats that like von Riebel Trump has not escaped punishment after for crimes in World War II. I would also like to remind you that Adolf Eichmann also did not, uh, gone, uh, did not go unpunished. Nobody uh, of, uh, of them escaped the punishment. But the main thing is today is to, it's time to transform the system, the United Nations. So therefore, I propose to convene a global conference, and we can do it here in peaceful cave in order to de determine how we are going to reform the world security system, how we will rely, uh, uh, how do we establish guarantee of uh, recognition of borders and integrity of states and countries, how we will assert the rule of international law. It is now clear that the goals set in San Francisco in 1945 for the creation of a global security international organization has not been achieved, and it is impossible to achieve them without reforms. Therefore, we must do everything in our power to pass on to the next generation an effective UN with the ability to respond preventively to security challenges and thus guarantee peace, prevent aggression and force aggressors to peace, have the determination and ability to punish if the principles of peace these are violated. Uh, there can be no more exceptions of privileges. Everybody must be equal. All participants of international relations, regardless of economic strength, geographical area, and individual ambitions. The power of peace must become dominant. The power of justice and the security uh, power as Ukraine, uh, humanity has always dreamed of it. Ukraine is ready to provide a platform for one of the main offices of the up newly uh, updated security system, similar to the Geneva office that deals with human rights, the Nairobi office that deals with environmental protection, and in Kiev we can have U24 office that can specialize in preventive measures to maintain peace. I would like to remind you of our peaceful mission in Afghanistan. When we Ukrainians evacuated from that country, over thousands, more than 1,000 people from, uh, uh, with, uh, at our own extent. It was a very difficult phase, uh, and Ukraine uh, came to their help. We took in people of different nationalities, ethnic groups, different faiths, Afghan citizens of, the, the European, of European countries, U.S., Canada. We did not know who needed uh, help, was it one of our own? Own or somebody else, we helped all of them, we saved everyone. If every time there was a need, everyone in the world would be confident that help could would come, the world would be definitely safer. Therefore, Ukraine has the, uh, the moral right to propose a reform of the world security system. We have proven that we helped others not only happy time, but in dark times too. And now we need decisions from the Security Council for peace in Ukraine. If you do not know how to, uh, uh, to make this decision, you can do two things, either remove Russia as an aggressor and a source of war, so it cannot block decisions about its own aggression, its own war.
and then do everything that we can do uh, to establish peace. Or the other option is please show how we can uh, re reform or change, uh, dissolve yourself and, uh, and, 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 and work for peace. Or if there is no alternative and no option, then the next option would be dissolve yourself altogether. And I know that um, you can admit that if there is nothing that you can do besides conversation, we need peace. We, Ukraine peace needs Peace. Europe needs peace, yeah. and the world needs Dujo peace. And Zara. finally, I would kindly ask you very much to watch this short video. Please give us one more minute of your time, the video that we uh, want to show that one, one country can violate rights, and if that's uh, the result of being unpunished. If possible, please watch this video, because it is impossible to get everyone to come to our country and see it with your own eyes. Therefore, I would ask you to watch this video. Thank you very much. I'm not sure the video is it just coming Uh, uploaded to the technicians of the Security Council. So they have it in their possession. I, we will sort that one out uh, technically. We don't have the video. Um, so I propose that while we sort that out, uh, I thank His Excellency Mr. Zelensky for his compelling and powerful remarks. We will come back to the video when we've sorted out the technical uh, the technical issues around it. And may I say, speaking in my national capacity, may I express appreciation to the President uh, for his leadership in wartime and for the extraordinary fortitude and bravery of the Ukrainian people under this unprovoked and illegal invasion. I resume my function as the President of the Security Council and while we sort out the uh, technical video, I propose to give the floor to those council members who wish to make statements. And I now give the floor to the representative of the United States. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, let me also start by thanking UAE and Ambassador Nisibe for her successful presidency during the month of March. Madam President, as you begin your Security Council presidency, I want to thank the United Kingdom for your leadership and for organizing this vital discussion on Ukraine today. I also want to thank the Secretary General for his remarks and the other briefers. And I'd like to extend a warm welcome to President Zelensky. I was so moved by the address he made recently to our Congress and we are truly honored by his presence here under the circumstances that he and Ukraine face today. Madam President, last night I returned from a trip to Moldova and Romania. I saw with my own eyes the refugee crisis caused by Russia's unconscionable war. I spoke to refugees who indicated to me their desires to return to their home. And we've all seen the images on TV of the bombed out buildings. But what we have not seen is that behind those destroyed buildings, 
or destroyed lives and destroyed families. I met with women and children who had fled Ukraine who stuffed their lives into backpacks and left the only home they had ever known. And these were sobering conversations. One young woman I spoke to came with her six-year-old brother who had autism and is struggling with cancer. Their single mother helped them escape to save their lives. But Russia's war has interrupted the care her brother desperately needs. Another woman I spoke to fled with her eight-year-old from Odessa. The father, who they'd left behind, told them there was shelling right next to their apartment that very night. And they very well could have died had they not left. A third woman I met told me that she used to love to travel, but never expected her next trip would be to flee her life, flee for her life. When I asked her where she was from, she started to say, and then she stopped with tears in her eyes and said, I'm sorry, I don't know how to say it, whether I live in Kyiv or whether I used to live in Kyiv. She was realizing in the moment just how dramatically her life had changed because of this senseless war. These are three stories of more than 10 million people, 6 million internally displaced, 4 million who have left Ukraine altogether, 4 million people who have relied on the big heartedness of countries like Moldova, Romania, Poland, Slovakia, Hungary, and others across the region and the world to welcome and support all those leaving Ukraine in search of safety. Ukraine's neighbors are bearing the brunt of Europe's most significant refugee crisis since World War II. And I want these countries to know that they have a committed partner in the United States. And that is why the United States announced recently that we are prepared to provide more than one billion US dollars in new funding toward humanitarian assistance for those affected by Russia's war in Ukraine and its severe impact around the world. And it is why we are welcoming up to 100,000 Ukrainians and others fleeing Russia's aggression to the United States. We will continue to assist humanitarian efforts to help the people of Ukraine and all those fleeing Putin's violence. But as heart-wrenching as the stories are that I heard in Moldova and Romania, there are some stories we will never get to hear. Those of the people we saw in the images out of Bucha. We've all seen the gruesome photos. Lifeless bodies lying in the streets, apparently summarily executed, their hands tied behind their backs. As we work to independently confirm the events depicted in these images, I would remind this council that based on the currently available information, the United States has assessed that members of Russia's forces have committed war crimes in Ukraine. And even before seeing the images from Bucha, President Zelensky, along with others in the region, were reporting that children were being abducted. And we heard him say that today. Also abducted are mayors and doctors, religious leaders, journalists, and all who dare defy Russia's aggression. Some of them, according to credible reports, including by the Maripol City Council, have been taken to so-called filtration camps where Russian forces are reportedly making tens of thousands of Ukrainian citizens relocate to Russia. Reports indicate that Russian federal security agents are confiscating passports and IDs, taking away cell phones, and separating families from one another. I do not need to spell out what these so-called filtration camps are reminiscent of. It's chilling, and we cannot look away. 
Every day we see more and more how little Russia respects human rights. And that is why I announced yesterday that the United States in coordination with Ukraine and many other UN member states will seek Russia's suspension from the UN Human Rights Council. Given the growing mountain of evidence, Russia should not have a position of authority in a body whose purpose, whose very purpose is to promote respect for human rights. Not only is this the height of hypocrisy, it is dangerous. Russia is using its membership on the Human Rights Council as a platform for propaganda to suggest Russia has a legitimate concern for human rights. In fact, we will hear some of that propaganda here today, I know. And I will not dignify these lies with a response, only to say that every lie we hear from the Russian representative is more evidence that they do not belong on the Human Rights Council. 140 UN member states voted to condemn Russia over its unprovoked war and the humanitarian crisis it has unleashed upon the people of Ukraine. Here's my message to all of you. Now is the time to match those words with action and show the world that we can work responsibly. And I share President Zelensky's view that this moment requires responsible world powers and global leaders to show some backbone and stand up to Russia's dangerous and unprovoked threat against Ukraine and the world. The Secretary General said that confronting this threat is the Security Council's charge. It is, and it is also the responsibility of UN leaders and leaders around the world, every single member state with a voice in the GA. No one can be a shield for Russia's aggression. Suspending Russia from the Human Rights Council is something we collectively have the power to do in the General Assembly. Our votes can make a real difference. Russia's participation on the Human Rights Council hurts the Council's credibility. It undermines the entire UN, and it is just plain wrong. Let us come together to do what is right and do right by the Ukrainian people. Let us take this step to help them to start to rebuild their lives. And let us match the courage of President Zelensky, who we are so honored to have with us today. President Zelensky, I want you to know that we stand with the people of Ukraine as you face down this brutal attack on your sovereignty, on your democracy, and on your freedom. Thank you. I thank the representative of the United States for her statement, and I give the floor to the representative of Albania. Thank you, Madam President. Let me thank Ambassador Nusibe for having steered our work during the month of March and wish the UK and you, Madam President, full success in our common work during this month. Albania welcomes President Zelensky's presence to this meeting. His remarks are painful, and his account on what Ukraine is experiencing under Russian occupation is revolting. We stand by you, Mr. President, by your compatriots, all Ukrainians, for their heroic resistance, for their resilience that the entire world is admiring. You are not alone. You have the world on your side, because it's the, it's the side of the right, of the just, and as we hope, of victory. Slava Ukraini. Madam President, let me thank S.G. Guterres for his, again, very clear and powerful remarks. I also thank USG Di Carlo and Griffiths for their updates. This is the 14th meeting of the Security Council on Ukraine since the 31st of January, while the war of aggression has entered the second month. Let's establish a few basic yet meaningful facts. Russia has stalled and its imperial dreams are nowhere. 
Taking Ukraine finally proved impossible. Kiev was too hard to swallow. Russian army is in disarray, but it has not stopped shelling and bombardments. But all this is not new, and all this is not news. The real news that has horrified the world is what Russia is leaving behind. The unspeakable horrors, those soul-crushing images in areas from which Russia is withdrawing. Images of civilians executed with a bullet in the neck, sometimes with their hands tied behind their backs or shot dead in their bicycles. Images of mass graves overflowing with corpses. Images of carnage and devastation, including looted homes, rape, and sexual violence, acts usually attributed only to thugs. They spring from the same cruel impulses as the bombardment of cities, homes, hospitals, schools, and kindergartens by the Russian forces. Bucha is an open-air graveyard, the notorious facelift of the Russian aggression. Madam President, we have heard time and again, it is not Russia. Yes, but no. It will be hard, actually impossible, to convince anyone that the destroyed tanks that clutter the roads, the mines and booby traps left behind amid the wreckage, and the bodies of civilians killed by arbitrary executions and laying in the streets amidst debris are staged scenes for propaganda. Who would believe that Russia aggressed Ukraine simply to protect civilians, while Ukraine is busy staging horror movies? You may muzzle media back home, but you cannot fool satellite images. You cannot blind independent reporters and human rights NGOs on the ground. Waiting for Russia to accept and tell the truth is waiting for Godot to arrive, and he never does. These are facts, hard and sickening proof of the atrocities committed, the ugly face of this madness. Such crimes, as documented by Human Rights Watch and verified by independent and respected professional reporters, those who are banned for the Russians call for answers, call for thorough investigation, for effective accountability, for justice. Prime Minister Rama called these crimes a terrible pain and a horrible shame. Russia has an international obligation to abide by international humanitarian law, the laws of war, including the Geneva Conventions of 49 and its first additional protocol. Russia has an obligation to abide by the order of ICJ to immediately halt its military activity in Ukraine. But unfortunately, Russia has made another choice, not to respect any of it, and has cancelled itself from international law. But the law will pursue it. Russian army and its commanders cannot escape accountability. The name of the butcher of Maripol, a criminal that has reduced an entire city to ashes and has made its citizens go from three meals a day to barely three meals a week, is engraved in the ruins of the city. This is why we will support the call to suspend Russia's participation in the Human Rights Council. The UNGA resolution that created the Council stipulates that, and I quote, members of the Council will respect the highest standards in the promotion and protection of human rights. As we see, Russia's standards are nose-eating, and its presence there is a farce, a desecration of the place that is called to be the sanctuary of rights. Dear colleagues, Russia has announced that it will now shift its focus on eastern Ukraine. This means that it will concentrate its brutality there in what may end up becoming a war of attrition. Russia has blocked the renewal of the OSCE International Observer, Observer Mission in Ukraine. This denies the international community the independent eyes it needs there. This anticipates, sadly, more war, further atrocities, other crimes, even more humanitarian disasters. This war continues to particularly affect women and children. Millions have been displaced, many of them alone, in search of safety and security. It is heartbreaking to see mothers write names and addresses in the back of their children so that they are recognized in case they end up being orphans. 
We welcome the efforts of OSHA and its partners to deliver assistance in support of the people in Ukraine and the millions of refugees in neighboring countries. Madam President, let me end with this note. Rarely has the outcome of a war been so disastrously the, op the complete opposite of what it wanted to achieve. Russia's army has been defeated by the outgunned and outnumbered Ukrainian resistance. Russia is isolated like never in its history. It has become the world's most sanctioned country in history. No country has ever seen itself transform in a matter of only 10 days from a global player into a financial and international pariah, to the point that it is obliged to find comfort in the support from North Korea and Syria. Dear colleagues, this aggression is, and its startling defeat have once and for all separated the fates of Ukrainians and Russians, because the case of Ukraine is also the cause of democracy against tyranny and kleptocracy. It is a fight between the will of the people against the will, against the vicious will of one whose reckless actions have challenged everything we stand for and who is directly responsible for the economic disruption and food insecurity which is affecting the entire world. He may choose to stop, withdraw troops, and quit Ukraine, or continue to dissent in the very abyss he has created and face the consequences. I thank you. I thank the representative of Albania for his statement. I understand that we now have solved the technical problems, so I suggest we return to the video. Thank you. I would like to thank the delegation of Ukraine for sharing uh, that video with us. The images are harrowing. Speaking in my national capacity, we are appalled by what we have seen and reiterate our solidarity with Ukraine. I resume my function as the council president, and I now give the floor to the representative of Gabon. Je voudrais uh, d'abord like exprimer to, la, at the outset, mon appréciation à l'ambassadeur des Émirats Arabes Unis pour sa présidence Arab remarquable. Je remercie le secrétaire I général. Monsieur Antonio Guterres, la secrétaire générale adjointe, Madame Rosemary Di Carlo, ainsi que Monsieur Martin Griffith pour leurs exposés respectifs. Je salue la, per la participation à I cette réunion du président Zelensky. Madame la présidente, nous continuons d'assister impuissants à pendant que se déroule Ukraine. le décompte macabre While des grim morts, toll of the dead que les personnes déplacées et que les combats se poursuivent au même rythme que la courbe des statistiques, les pertes en hommes et en infrastructures civiles ne cessent de se 
Un jour de guerre est day décidément in, un out. jour de trop. One day of war is one, Alors que le conflit a doubt, one est dans sa sixième and semaine, le nombre de personnes déplacées week, the number of dépasse à présent les 10 millions. Is now surpassing the 10 million près de 4 mark, millions de réfugiés dans les pays have sought refuge Il in neighboring countries. This is a frightening humanitarian catastrophe, the repercussions of, will, of which are sure to worsen as a result of the risks of food insecurity due to the unpredictability of harvests, which will in turn have trans-regional knock-on effects. I'd like to welcome the Secretary General's uh, establishment of a working group task force on uh, uh, food security, energy, and finance to Madame reduce the impact of the war. Madam President, Les allégations, concernant allegations concerning notamment sexuelles violence, contre les femmes especially sexual violence against women, de très are cause for grave, Mon very grave concern. My country is very concerned as well les at les attacks against et les infrastructure and humanitarian personnel. Les qui sur les lieux de combat humanitarian workers working in theaters of conflict should never be the target of armed attacks. They are very often the link between victims of war and what remains of humanity when the rug has been pulled from under their feet. Humanitarian workers should be able to funnel humanitarian assistance to wherever it is needed without obstacles and in conditions of security guaranteed by all parties. Des convois it should be possible to form secure evacuation convoys to allow for the smooth evacuation of persons wishing to leave combat zones. This is a vital, a vital form of assistance to the almost 18 million people in need of humanitarian assistance in Ukraine. The situation, the situation in Mariupol, to mention just this town, is becoming plainly untenable. The exponential deterioration in living conditions, indeed survival conditions in certain places, is very concerning. Señora, eh, señora Presidenta del Congreso de Diputados, el, señor, señor, estimado señor затримку щойно я виступав перед Радою безпеки ООН, але це абсолютно не означає неповаги для вас. Ця затримка це технічний момент. Дякую за цю можливість великою повагою від усього українського народу до вас. Я звертаюсь до вас з надією, що саме ви зрозумієте найбільше наш біль від війни і нашу надію на мир. Тому що для нас в Україні зараз під загрозою абсолютно все, що і для вас є основою суспільного життя. Ви одна з найбільших країн Європи, одна з найбільш трокатих, але об'єднаних демократією і повагою до кожної людини, до кожної спільноти. As soon as possible, to shed light on the victims and the circumstances surrounding these atrocities. In the interim, it is vital that this council not lose sight of its role, which is to work towards restoring peace and security by offering an alternative to war. The return to peace in Ukraine will not be achieved through mudslinging. Madam President, this war has lasted long enough, and its effects are already being felt felt beyond Ukraine's borders. Vue, From our perspective, the equation is posed in terms of a decision on establishing a ceasefire and on creating the conditions for safe and unfettered provision of humanitarian assistance needed by populations in distress. I wish to reiterate Gabon's appreciation to neighboring countries that continue to mobilize to uh, urgently welcome refugees. We encourage them to extend the same welcome to all persons in distress without distinction as to origin or race, including African national students. We request them 
to ensure respect for their dignity and we call for fair treatment of all persons in distress. It is urgent that the parties commit resolutely to negotiation to bring an end to the hostilities. We call to a de-escalation and a halt to the combat. There is no other way. My country is closely following current negotiations between the parties, especially in Istanbul, and we hope that they will soon lead to a ceasefire so as to create a climate of confidence and to establish the climate of calm needed for diplomacy to make its voice heard and for the guns to be silenced. Thank you. I thank the representative of Gabon for her statement, and I now give the floor to the representative of the Russian Federation. Thank you, Madam President. President. I would like to express our gratitude to the uh, delegation of the United Arab Emirates for their presidency in the month of March. We are also grateful to the Secretary General, to Rosemary DiCarlo and Martin Griffith for their briefings. We also listened to the President of Ukraine, Vladimir Zelensky. I would like to thank Martin for his visit to Moscow, during which, as far as we can uh, judge, he had uh, some useful meetings and discussions. Uh, better than anyone else, he should know the efforts that Russia is undertaking every single day to organize humanitarian corridors. However, the arrangements reached with the help of uh, international mediators is consistently not being uh, implemented by the Ukrainian side. I'm not going to uh, overload you with figures. You can, uh, uh, such communiques are published every single day by our Ministry of Defense. I simply would like to say that just out of Mariupol toward the east, without any participation by the Ukrainian side, we have managed to save 123,500 people. Now, overall, since the beginning of the special military operation, over 600,000 uh, people have been evacuated to Russia, uh, including over 100. 19,000 children, and we're not talking about any kind of coercion or abduction as our Western partners like to uh, present this, but rather uh, the voluntary decision by these people uh, is testified by many uh, videos that are accessible uh, in social media. Madam President, uh, another topic of the meeting was declared today, which uh, is practically not being discussed today, so I'm going to uh, leave that out. I simply would like to uh, take advantage of the virtual presence here of the uh, President of Ukraine and would like to uh, address him directly. Now, we place on in your conscience, uh, the uh, ungrounded uh, uh, accusations against the Russian military, which are not confirmed by any uh, any eyewitnesses, and we spoke about this in detail yesterday at our press conference. Vladimir Alexandrovich, we all remember that when in 2019 you were elected as the president of Ukraine. Now, there were a lot of hopes uh, tied to your election because uh, you. Uh, uh, you uh, were, as a candidate, uh, pledged peace and an end to the war in Donbass, uh, uh, including the Russian-speaking population, which you pledged to protect. So it seems that we were on the verge of correcting the historical injustice when, as a result of the Maidan uh, coup in 2014, uh, Ukraine began to be transformed into a hateful anti-Russia, and that seemed to be on the verge of being turned, uh, that page of being turned. However, those hopes uh, failed to be, uh, to materialize, and now you scornfully call the, uh, the residents of uh, Donetsk and Lugansk uh, People's Republic as a subspecies. Repeating what your predecessor uh, stated, who in fact uh, threatened that uh, the residents of the Donetsk and Lugansk will rot in their basements. And you are calling on them to uh, return, to leave, 
И вот вы уже ополчились на родной для вас русский язык, вводя по сути языковую инквизицию в стране, где русский является родным для как минимум 40% А сегодня взрывы и снаряды звучат почти по всей территории, на всей территории Украины, не только на востоке, где они не смолкали 8 лет. И звучат они именно потому, что другого способа После того, как вы и ваши подчиненные, приготовившись к этому уже в марте проблему Донбасса Нам говорят, что на Украине не может быть нацистов. Однако мы прекрасно знаем, что они у вас не только есть, Да и как может быть иначе, если национальными героями Украины являются нацистские посольники Бандера и Шухевич, ответственные не только за Холокост, но и за убийство сотен тысяч мирных поляков, русских, украинцев и евреев. Вы просто предпочли не замечать украинских ненацистов, делающихся в Они, к сожалению, есть, и их еще больше, к сожалению, очень много, а среди них много молодых. They, they are very many of them, and among them, a lot of young people. How do we know that? Well, they're not concealing it. They have tattoos made, Nazi tattoos. They decorate their clothing with swastikas and other Nazi symbols. They greet each other. Их особенно много в составе национальных батальонов, таких как Айдар, правый сектор И это было бы ладно, но они еще действуют как нацисты, убивают такими. Причем не только пленных российских солдат, мучениями которых потом похвалятся в интернете, но и своих. Ваши неонацисты, беспримерные жестокости, которые они используют в качестве жилища и устанавливают рядом с жилыми домами тяжелые и position heavy artillery next to residential buildings and Мы multiple rocket launchers as well. Today we've heard once again a huge amount of lies about Russian uh, soldiers and military. Мы у нас есть сотни, если не тысячи, тысячи видеосвидетельств людей, которые готовы дать показания о жестокости украинских националистов. Зачитаю здесь лишь некоторые из них. Это жестокие истории, но вы должны их услышать. Наталья Кудинова, Наталья Кудинова мэр города, бежала одним из первых. Затем украинская власть врала, что Россия не пропускает людей по гуманитарному коридору. Женщин с детьми нас батальон АЗОВ под страхом смерти удерживал в подвалах и грабил на блок поставленных Бабушка с мучками рассказывала, как батальон АЗОВ не давал выйти из подвала, и кто сделал шаг вперед, стрелял на поражение. На блок посту Азова девушек и женщин раздевали до гола и забирали золото и деньги, включая последние. Валентина Николаевна Борисенкова рассказывает, как украинские военные выгнали из частного дома на улице Краматорская женщину с двумя детьми и стреляли оттуда из минометов. Она со слезами на глазах ушла, выгнали из собственного дома и ее. Двое деток у нее, выгнали хлопцы, повязки голубые у них. Это украинские преподавательные знаки. Марина Васильевна рассказывала, как ее пытали в подвале СБУ Пристегнули меня в канализационной трубе. Когда, я узнали, когда узнали, что я русский, били, пытали электротоком, насиловали, угрожали привести несовершеннолетнюю дочь и съездили в Атону. Шиповала его Ольга Георгиевна. Выехали из Мариуполя, из Мангуши уже 25 марта. 
Огневые точки ВСУ стояли между домами и дворами, прикрываясь мирными По кварталу вокруг драм-театра ездил украинский танк, производил беспорядочные выстрелы. Стрельба велась по жилым домам. На территории 69-68 школы стояли танки. Видела своими глазами. Суппорт на Ольга Сергеевна. Школа номер 15 Мариуполя. 25 февраля в СУ заняли там свои позиции и уехали оттуда. 7 марта. Стрельбу оттуда производили. Наш дом пострадал от обстрела. 8-9 марта были очень сильные обстрелы. И именно целенаправленно было подано. Украинских военных спросили, зачем они это делают. Ответили, что пока весь русский дух не уничтожит, будут находиться там. Мародерство с их стороны началось сразу. Разграбили все магазины. Эвакуироваться нам помогли войска ДНР, довезли нас до Монгушки. Есть еще множество душераздирающих историй. Есть до смерти замученные украинцы, Есть убитые мародерами и преступниками, которым раздали оружие. Мирные граждане и иностранцы, гибель которых руководство Украины, вопреки фактам и здравому смыслу, пытается свалить на российских военных. Я говорил об этом еще раз, это подлость, это подлость думать о том, что российские военнослужащие способны на то, в чем это винить. А теперь еще есть и откровенные преступные установки с мирными украинцами, убитыми своими же радикалами, с тем, чтобы улучшить гебельсовские традиции, убитыми в тех районах, которые российские войска оставили после обнадежных войн. In the areas from which the Russian forces withdrew after encouraging peace negotiations in Istanbul. Now it turns out that we shouldn't have withdrawn. I'm talking about Bucha first and foremost. Вы видели трупы, слышали рассказы. Вы увидели только то, что вам хотели показать. Вы не можете не видеть выпиющих нестыковок той версии событий, которые продвигают украинские и западные сети. И то, что трупов в городе не было сразу после ухода российских войск, о чем свидетельствует сразу несколько видеосъемок. И то, что есть записи, где украинские радикалы призывают стрелять по тем, у кого белые повязки. То есть по мирным гражданам. Если вы смотрели внимательно видео, которое сегодня мы показывали, вы, увидели, вы бы заметили, что на тех людях, которые лежат на земле, есть белая повязка, это мирные граждане. И то, что трупы на видео никак не похожи на те, которые пролежали на улице тысячи а по сенсационным и абсолютно антинаучным данным Нью-Йорк Таймс вообще с 20 марта. Повестись на этот фейк могут либо абсолютные дилетанты, либо наши западные партнеры, которые ничего не хотят слушать и давно уже называют черно-белыми К сожалению, этим странам на саму Украину на Плевать. Она для них была и есть всего лишь пешка в геополитической игре против России, которую они легко пожертвуют. Но пока постараются продлить этот конфликт, оставляют это побольше роли и Но самое главное, повторю еще раз, как мы докатились до такого той жестокости, которая проявляют националисты, например, за зону. А вы, в данном случае, обращаясь к президенту Украины, в интервью американским СМИ стыдливо защищаете, говоря, что они такие, как есть. Хочу, чтобы вы задумались, и очень надеюсь, что вы найдете решение этой ситуации, потому что оно зависит только от вас. Потому что вы пришли вам не из-за украинских земель. Мы пришли, чтобы принести долгожданный мир на истекавшую кровь Не перемирие, а именно настоящий прочный мир. А для этого надо искоренить ту жестокость, которую говорят. Вырезать по нацистскую раковую опыту, которую пожирают Украину, со временем начала бы пожирать Россию. И мы добьемся этой цели, надеюсь, скорее, чем позже. Другого выхода быть не может. Мы не бьем по гражданским объектам, чтобы сберечь как можно больше мирных жителей. Потому и продвигаемся не так быстро, как многие ожидали. Мы не действуем так, как американцы и их союзники 
like Americans and their allies in Iraq and Syria were raising entire cities to the ground. They had no pity for them, but we felt great pity because these are вот радикалам, правда, нечего терять. наплевать на мирных жителей. Не дайте Западу реализовать свои планы, Владимир Примите правильное решение, необходимое для вашей страны, потому что Запад готов сражаться на Украине до последнего традиции. Примите это решение сейчас. Ведь реальную ситуацию на фронте вы прекрасно знаете. Потом может быть поздно. Later, uh, it might be too late soon. Thank you very much for your attention. I thank the representative of the Russian Federation for his statement, and I now give the floor to the representative of Ireland. Thank you very much, Madam President, and I'd also like to thank the Secretary General and our other briefers this morning. I want to express a very warm welcome to President Zelensky being with us this morning, President Zelensky, your courage, your leadership, and the courage of the Ukrainian people are an example to all of us. Secretary General, on the 24th of February, as Russia launched a large-scale invasion of its neighbor Ukraine, you told the world that Russia's action was wrong, that it was against the Charter, that it was unacceptable. We agreed with you. However, you also told us that this invasion was reversible and called on President Putin to end this war to save innocent lives. We echoed those calls. Sadly, 40 days later, our call has been left unanswered. Instead, over the last 40 days, we have witnessed unprecedented levels of destruction and human suffering. We are watching cities pounded by Russian artillery. We are seeing millions forced to flee their homes, seeking refuge from Russian aggression. Just minutes ago, here in this chamber, we have seen the utterly shocking images of civilians lying dead in the streets of Bucha and elsewhere in Ukraine. Some, we know, are piled into improvised mass graves. Simply harrowing. So many innocent lives lost on our watch as our pleas for peace go unheeded. The attempts here today to deny Russian culpability are frankly appalling in their cynicism. And I see them as an insult to the memory of those slaughtered civilians. Madam President, we roundly condemn the atrocities reportedly committed by the Russian armed forces in a number of occupied Ukrainian towns. The images from Bucha and other towns in the Kyiv region, liberated by Ukrainian forces, are horrifying. We here cannot suspend our humanity. Our thoughts, first and foremost, must be with the families of those killed. Their pain at the loss of their loved ones in such an unspeakable manner is almost unimaginable. Let's be clear. The Russian authorities are responsible for these atrocities committed while they had effective control of the area. The Russian authorities are subject to the international law of occupation. There can never be impunity from such crimes. Never, ever. Not in Bucha, not in other, any other town or village, ever. Where crimes have been committed, they must be fully investigated and evidence preserved so that these crimes can be prosecuted by domestic and international courts, including the International Criminal Court. Ireland will continue to support efforts to ensure robust and independent investigation of all violations of international law. We must have accountability and justice for the victims and for the survivors of this war. We at this table share that responsibility in face of such atrocity. We call on the Russian Federation to abide by the order of the International Court of Justice and to immediately cease its military action and withdraw from the entire territory of Ukraine. Madam President, in the last 40 days, we have seen a horrific humanitarian disaster 
unfold in Ukraine because of the Russian Federation's unprovoked and unjustifiable further invasion of that country. A country where just weeks ago, citizens lived in relative peace and prosperity, and one which has been transformed now into one where families lack access to basic necessities, where basements have become bob shelters, where millions, millions have become IDPs and refugees. The use of explosive weapons in populated areas has had a devastating impact on civilians in the midst of active hostilities. Once again, we call for the parties to the conflict to comply with international humanitarian law, including the obligation to direct attacks only against military objectives, the prohibitions against indiscriminate and disproportionate attacks, and the obligation to take all feasible precautions in attack. We have heard increasing allegations of sexual violence by Russian soldiers. You referred to this this morning, Secretary General. We must stress that conflict-related sexual violence can constitute a war crime. The perpetrators of such crimes must be accountable. They must be held accountable. They will be held accountable. Sexual violence is another abhorrent crime of this war that cannot go unanswered. We again reiterate the need for full, safe and unhindered humanitarian access to those in need, as called for today by Martin Griffiths. Secretary General, we again echo your call for Russia to implement an immediate humanitarian ceasefire. It is the very least the aggressor can do. It is way past time. As we know, the reverberations of this war are reaching far beyond Ukraine. It's unacceptable that Russia's war of choice against Ukraine is also having, and will continue to have, significant spillover effects across the globe. Deterioration of food security, surging energy prices, increasing poverty. The most vulnerable and impoverished in developing countries will suffer the most. We utterly reject that. Madam President, it is our collective responsibility here at this table to maintain international peace and security, nothing less. This is why we call on the Russian Federation to stop this war, to stop its unlawful attempts to establish occupying authorities, to stop destabilizing the democratic foundations of the Ukrainian state. Such steps are yet further reprehensible violations of Ukraine's independence, sovereignty, and territorial integrity. It gets harder each time to say this, but it is never too late to do the right thing and to end this war now. Thank you, Madam President. I thank the representative of Ireland for her statement, and I now give the floor to the representative of Brazil. Thank you, Madam President. Let me start by thanking Ambassador Nusebe, along with her team at the UAE mission, for competently navigating the work of the Security Council in March. I welcome His Excellency, Mr. Volodymyr Zelensky, President of Ukraine, in the Council today. I would like to thank the Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, and the Secretary General for Political Affairs, Rosemary Di Carlo, and Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs, Martin Griffiths, for their updated presentations about the situation in Ukraine. Madam President, as we enter into the sixth week of hostilities in the Ukrainian territory, we continue to witness appalling images of human suffering. The recent reports of acts of violence against civilians in Bucha, Irpin, Kharkiv, Donetsk, and other places affected by the conflict are extremely worrying, according to the statement by the ICRC. We call for a really independent and thorough investigation of all reported violations with the full cooperation of both parties to the conflict without prejudging any conclusions and underscore the need for perpetrators to be held accountable. 
the international community is witnessing for too long appalling scenes of destruction of once peaceful cities with shocking images from the conflict and the desperation of thousands of civilians trapped in the battlefield with no food, no water, and no electricity. Once again, we renew our pleas for a broad, effective, and immediate cessation of hostilities in Ukraine. Only after the silence of the guns and the withdrawal of troops are achieved will it be possible to halt the immense costs of human suffering this conflict has brought. Madam President, the General Assembly has recently adopted a resolution on the humanitarian situation in Ukraine. As we said on that occasion, the General Assembly could not become a bystander of the shocking consequences of the conflict. And as we added last week in this chamber, neither can the Security Council. As the main UN organ with primary responsibility for the maintenance of international peace and security, the Security Council has the mandate and the responsibility to address this situation in an effective manner. And nevertheless, our assessment is that the Security Council is failing in its role to help in supporting efforts to foster a constructive dialogue between the parties with the aim of brokering an effective peace settlement to this conflict. We deeply regret that the Security Council has not been able to speak with one voice throughout the crisis. Promoting compliance with international humanitarian law, protecting civilians, calling for peace, these are objectives that should unite rather than divide us. We should strive to create the conditions for, on the one hand, invigorating the political negotiations, and on the other, reaching an understanding on practical measures to minimize human suffering in Ukraine. Civilians wishing to flee the hostilities must be able to do so in safety, and those who decide to stay cannot become targets of attacks. In the same vein, parties must grant safe passage to relief consignments to those in need. Once again, Brazil reiterates the call for all parties to fully respect and ensure respect for international humanitarian law. The causes of conflict, whatever they are, do not undermine the obligations of all parties have to guarantee that civilians should be protected that the wounded receive medical care, uh, that humanitarian assistance reach those in need, and that detainees be treated humanely in all circumstances. There must be no politicization of humanitarian actions, nor selective application of international humanitarian law. Also, geopolitical objectives must not supersede the endeavor for peace, nor prolong the human suffering caused by war. Madam President, this conflict and its associated sanctions, apart from the enormous human suffering and devastation caused in Ukraine, is having spillover effects in the entire world, especially through increased prices of oil, gas, grains, and fertilizers, among others. Food insecurity has become an even greater threat to the world's poorest people, above all in developing countries. The longer this conflict persists, the higher the risk of further instability, hunger and devastation in Ukraine and around the world. It is high time to return to the path of dialogue and diplomacy for a peaceful settlement of the conflict. We urgently need the cessation of hostilities. De-escalation of tensions and negotiations are the only way out of this conflict, not only for the countries directly involved, but also for the entire world. I thank you, Madam President. I thank the representative of Brazil for his remarks, and I now give the floor to the representative of Kenya.
Uh, thank you, Madam President. I congratulate you on assuming the presidency of the Security Council for April and assure you of my delegation's full support. I listened closely to the remarks by the Secretary General and his Under Secretaries General, Rosemary DiCarlo and Martin Griffiths, hoping to hear that our fears that the war in Ukraine has entered a new, more dangerous phase were exaggerated. Sadly, they offered no such comfort. Instead, we are left with the words of His Excellency Volodymyr Zelensky, the President of Ukraine, who has described the horrifying suffering of civilians in Butcher and other towns and neighborhoods in Ukraine. His account of the atrocities is in stark contrast to that of our colleague in the Security Council, the representative of the Russian Federation. But the fact that the truth in Bucha is contested is the surest sign that we stand on the precipice of more widespread abuses of human rights. In April 1994, even as genocide engulfed Rwanda, there were members of the Security Council contesting the horrifying truth that a million people were being murdered. We should stand warned that the inability of the Council to establish the facts and accordingly attribute responsibility may enable the risk of escalation into far worse crimes. Beyond the city of Bucha, Madam President, we're extremely worried about the safety of civilians who are trapped in other besieged cities and villages, such as Mariupol and Kesson. Our actions today should seek to prevent what we have witnessed happen in Bucha take place in Mariupol and Kesson. While we debate who is responsible for the horrors of Bucha, it is incontestable that what started as a special military operation is now a war, and that what began with reassurances of limited aims, not targeted at civilians, has led to thousands of dead civilians and millions of refugees and internally displaced. No one can doubt that they are flagrant violations of international law, international humanitarian law, and the UN Charter underway in Ukraine. Kenya condemns the abuses undertaken in the past few weeks and those in the eastern provinces of the country during the years that the conflict has raged. Madam President, the war in Ukraine is today's most dangerous threat to the maintenance of international peace and security. It is the latest assault by the most powerful states against the multilateral order. Their continued abuse of the Charter created growing cracks over the years in the global security order. Now the bottom has fallen out. Ukraine may now become a model for a new generation of disastrous wars on multiple continents. Millions of refugees are being created and there will be many more as the economic effects of the war produce and intensify conflicts elsewhere. Accelerating food and energy prices are plunging millions into worse forms of poverty. The UN as a forum for solutions to humanity's most pressing problems is losing prestige and its historical standing. President Zelensky has left us with ideas for Security Council reform that we need to consider seriously. Things have fallen apart and the center cannot hold under these assaults on our United Nations. We must reform. There are no easy solutions. Even a negotiation that is not properly structured to protect the people and sovereignty of Ukraine could be the prelude to a wider war. For now, we urge the following urgent steps, understanding their limits due to the continued inability of the Security Council to act decisively. We call for an impartial and prompt United Nations investigation into the atrocities against the civilians in Butcher and other towns in Ukraine. This calls for an immediate end of all hostilities to guarantee unfettered access by the investigating teams. We urge the conflicting parties to immediately make clear to their military personnel that they will be held to account on the basis of command or superior responsibility 
if they violate the international laws that regulate warfare. We commend Ukraine's neighbors for opening their borders to refugees of multiple nationalities from Ukraine. We continue to urge them to ensure that the thousands of affected Africans be treated in accordance with international humanitarian law and basic dignity. We commend OCHA and many other organizations and individuals who have come to the aid of the deserving people of Ukraine. In this regard, we welcome the third UN organized humanitarian convoy that reached thousands of people in need in Sumi and other cities. We call for the urgent activation of safe passages with no restrictions and call for unimpeded humanitarian access to the many in need, particularly those in Mariupol, Kesson, and other besieged cities. We also urge the Security Council to reassure the world of its relevance by approaching the other conflicts with renewed vigor. The humanitarian crisis caused by conflict in Afghanistan, in Haiti, the Horn of Africa, the unfolding situation in the Korean Peninsula, Lebanon, Libya, Myanmar, Palestine and Israel, Syria, Yemen, and the Sahel deserve our urgent attention. We look forward to the Secretary General rallying the international community to deploy resources to cushion the most vulnerable from the effects of the conflict in Ukraine. We will reiterate our call for the cessation of hostilities to allow humanitarian operations under clearly defined contact lines and humanitarian passages. Madam President, I finish by reaffirming Kenya's recognition of the inviolable rights of Ukraine to its sovereignty, territorial integrity, and political independence. I thank you. I thank the representative of Kenya for his statement, and I now give the floor to the representative of Mexico. Señora. Presidenta, Madam President, le deseamos uh, éxito durante su presidencia este mes y reconocemos and el trabajo de Emiratos Árabes Unidos en la conducción del Consejo de Seguridad el mes pasado. Agradecemos las presentaciones del secretario general y de los subsecretarios Carlo General y Carlo and Griffiths y reconocemos la participación del presidente Volodymyr Zelensky en esta sesión Zelensky del Consejo de Seguridad. Le hemos escuchado con la mayor atención so y con el respeto que nos merece su investidura. The respect due También hemos visto con horror las imágenes que nos ha compartido. Son el mural de Guernica, they recreado like una vez más mural con víctimas civiles. With even more Desde hace victims. seis semanas, weeks, el mundo sigue con consternación las consecuencias devastadoras de la invasión de Rusia sobre Ucrania. A través de dos resoluciones de la Asamblea General, la comunidad internacional se ha pronunciado de manera contundente, deplorando dicha invasión, exigiendo el cese inmediato de las hostilidades y de cualquier cualquier ataque contra la población civil o la infraestructura de carácter civil y ha señalado la urgencia de que llegue la asistencia humanitaria de forma expedita, segura e irrestricta. La Corte Internacional de Justicia exigió también la suspensión inmediata de las operaciones militares en territorio de Ucrania. Toca a las Naciones Unidas actuar como garante del cumplimiento de las decisiones de la Corte. Todos los mecanismos de solución pacífica de las controversias que establece el derecho internacional deben canalizarse hacia ese objetivo común. Lamentablemente, las hostilidades continúan y las afectaciones civiles aumentan y junto con ellas aumentan las necesidades de la población, incluidas cada vez con mayor urgencia la de los refugiados y los desplazados internos. Las imágenes de las calles 
the flood of images of the streets of Bucha and other cities circulating in recent days have moved the world. Condenamos de manera enérgica las atrocidades que en ellas se reflejan. Captured in those no hay images. absolutamente There is nada que las justifique. Proteger a la población Protecting civil es una responsabilidad irrenunciable de la comunidad internacional. internacional. Como lo ha señalado la alta comisionada para los derechos humanos, out, las graves violaciones al derecho internacional humanitario y al derecho internacional de los derechos humanos obligan human a mantener la posibilidad de que efectivamente se haya incurrido en crímenes de guerra. México respalda Mexico cabalmente la declaración del secretario general para que se realicen a la brevedad investigaciones imparciales que permitan identificar responsables y una eficaz rendición de cuentas. Igualmente, seguimos con atención el trabajo de la Corte Penal Internacional y apoyamos al fiscal que se encuentra en proceso de investigar supuestos crímenes internacionales cometidos en Ucrania, así como a la Comisión de Investigación Independiente creado con esos mismos propósitos por el Consejo de Derechos Humanos de la ONU. Sus informes serán determinantes. Their Las consecuencias de esta guerra han sido terribles. Su impacto dramático horrifying. tendrá también efectos It's graves en el mediano y el largo plazo, no solo en la región, sino en todo el resto del mundo. Como Not lo ha dicho region, con claridad el director ejecutivo del Programa Mundial de Alimentos, millones program, de personas pagarán en carne propia el precio de este conflicto. Habrá escasez de alimentos básicos en muchas regiones supplies of basic food items will run short in many regions where they are already insecure and fragile. Now, given all the difficulties that this crisis implies and the urgency ensue, the efforts of the international community to tackle the humanitarian tragedy are only temporary. The solution, as it has been said, is y un acuerdo político que restaure la negociación por la vía diplomática. Apoyamos decididamente las gestiones del subsecretario Griffiths para acordar pausas humanitarias que permitan crear las condiciones en el terreno para que llegue con mayor fluidez la asistencia humanitaria. México reconoce y encomia el trabajo de todos los actores humanitarios involucrados en Ucrania, así como la solidaridad de los países vecinos que han recibido a millones de refugiados y los esfuerzos de mediación and the mediation países of y various actors Esperamos and que este countries. Consejo It is our hope apego that this Council will fulfill its responsibility to contribute effectively to al derecho putting an end de los to the war humanos, and restoring peace and to do so in strict compliance with international law and international guerra, humanitarian law la paz. and Gracias, put an end Presidenta. to war and restore peace. Thank you. I thank the representative of Mexico for his statement, and I now give the floor to the representative of India. Thank you, Madam President. Let me begin by thanking Secretary General Antonio Guterres for his presence and remarks on the situation in Ukraine. I also thank USG Rosemary DiCarlo and USD Martin Griffiths for their respective briefings on the security and humanitarian situation. We thank the participation of His Excellency, the President of Ukraine, at today's meeting. I also take this opportunity to thank the United Arab Emirates and Ambassador Lana Nusaiba for their excellent presidency. Madam President, the situation in Ukraine has not shown any significant improvement since the Council last discussed the issue. The security situation has only deteriorated, as well as its humanitarian consequences. 
Recent reports of civilian killings in Busha are deeply disturbing. We unequivocally condemn these killings and support the call for an independent investigation. We hope the international community will continue to respond positively to the humanitarian needs. We support calls urging for guarantees of safe passage to deliver essential humanitarian and medical supplies. Keeping in view the dire humanitarian situation in Ukraine, India has been sending humanitarian supplies to Ukraine and its neighbors, which include medicines and other essential relief material. We stand ready to provide more medical supplies to Ukraine in the coming days. India continues to remain deeply concerned at the worsening situation and reiterates its call for immediate cessation of violence and end to hostilities. We have emphasized right from the beginning of the conflict the need to pursue the path of diplomacy and dialogue. When innocent human lives are at stake, diplomacy must prevail as the only viable option. In this context, we take note of the ongoing efforts, including the meetings held recently between the parties. The impact of the crisis is being felt beyond the region with increasing food and energy costs, especially for many developing countries. It is in our collective interest to work constructively, both inside the United Nations and outside, towards seeking an early resolution to the conflict. Allow me to reiterate the importance of UN Guiding Principles humanitarian assistance once again. Humanitarian action must always be guided by the principles of humanitarian assistance, just humanity, neutrality, impartiality, and independence. These measures should never be politicized. We continue to emphasize to all member states of the UN that the global order is anchored on international law, UN Charter, and respect for territorial integrity and sovereignty of states. I thank you, Madam President. I thank the representative of India for his statement, and I now give the floor to the representative of China. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, I first of all would like to congratulate you upon assuming the presidency of the Council for this month. At the same time, I would also like to thank Ambassador Nusebe as well as the UAE team for their outstanding work when uh, UAE was the president of the Council during the month of March. Madam President, de-escalating tension in Ukraine and putting an early end to the fighting is the urgent expectation of the international community and the strong desire of China. We have many times emphasized that dialogue and negotiation is the only way out for opening the door of peace. Russia and Ukraine have already had uh, many rounds of negotiations. We welcome the two sides to stick to the general direction of uh, peace negotiations, overcome difficulties and differences, and continue to build conditions for a comprehensive settlement of the crisis. The international community should create favorable conditions and environment for negotiations between the two sides, open up space for political settlement and should not set up roadblocks to increase resistance for peace, let alone add fuel to the fire to aggravate confrontations. Every effort should be made to prevent the escalation of the localized conflict. China attaches great importance to the humanitarian issue in Ukraine and supports all initiatives and measures conducive to alleviate the humanitarian crisis in Ukraine. As the current conflict continues, we call on the parties to abide by international humanitarian law, protect the safety of civilians and civilian facilities, minimize civilian casualties, and ensure safe and smooth evacuation and access of humanitarian corridors, as well as guarantee the basic rights of women, children, and wounded fighters. Humanitarian issues should not be politicized. The humanitarian needs of Ukraine and its neighboring countries are enormous. International humanitarian agencies should maintain neutral uh, and impartial 
uh, okay. should maintain neutrality and impartiality, actively mobilize and coordinate more resources and make and remitting efforts to save lives and protect civilians. China has provided and will continue to provide humanitarian assistance to Ukraine and its neighboring countries. Under international law, civilians should be spared of any forms of violence in armed conflict, and attacks against civilians are unacceptable and should not occur. The reports and images of civilian deaths in Bucha are very disturbing, and the relevant circumstances and specific causes of the incident must be verified and established. Any and all accusations should be based on facts. Before conclusions are drawn, parties should exercise restraint and avoid unfounded accusations. Madam President, as pointed out by Secretary General Guterres, the spillover effects of the Ukrainian crisis is having a major impact on the world and the developing countries in particular. This requires our great attention and our strengthened management. Sanctions are not an effective means to solve the problem, but will instead accelerate the spillover of the crisis and bring new and complex problems. Today, with the deep development of globalization and the closely linked community of mankind, the implementation of all dimensional and indiscriminate sanctions is tantamount to politicizing instrumentalizing and weaponizing the world economy, triggering serious crises in the fields of global economy and trade, finance, energy, food, industrial chain, and supply chain, and endangering decades of development gains of the international community and making people of all countries pay a hefty price. The vast number of developing countries are not parties to the conflict and should not be involved in this confrontation, let alone be forced to bear the consequences of geopolitical conflicts and great power competition. The world's major economies should be responsible for managing the risk of crisis spillover and maintaining the stability of global markets and the momentum of the global economic recovery. Madam President, more than 30 years after the end of the Cold War, such a geopolitical tragedy taking place of in Europe now deserves our profound reflection. The sovereignty and territorial integrity of all countries should be respected, and small and medium-sized countries should not be pushed to the forefront of confrontation between and among great powers. All countries have the right to decide their foreign policy independently and should not be forced to take sides. The security of all countries is inseparable, and the security of one country cannot be achieved at the expense of the security of others. We we call upon the United States, NATO, and the European Union to engage in comprehensive dialogues with Russia to face head-on their differences accumulated over the years, find solutions to the problem, and promote the building of a balanced, effective, and sustainable regional security framework. On the issue of Ukraine, China does not seek geopolitical self-interest. It is not our mindset to watch the situation indifferently from the sideline, let alone do anything to add fuel to the fire. There is only one goal we sincerely look forward to, and that is peace. China will continue to promote peace talks and play a constructive and responsible role in helping resolve the crisis in Ukraine. I thank you, Madam President. I thank the representative of China for his statement, and I now give the floor to the representative of France. Madame la Présidente, Madam je salue la participation du président Zelensky à cette réunion, et à travers lui, le courage et l'esprit de résistance du peuple ukrainien. La France se tient à vos côtés. Je remercie le secrétaire général, la secrétaire générale adjointe aux affaires politiques et le secrétaire général adjoint aux affaires humanitaires de leurs interventions. La guerre d'agression que la Russie livre contre l'Ukraine a franchi ces derniers jours un nouveau cap dans l'horreur. Les images 
de charniers, d'exactions de masse contre des civils dans les localités du nord de l'Ukraine, à Boucha, à Borodianka, Motiyin, ont suscité la condamnation et l'indignation partout dans le monde. Nous exprimons toute notre compassion pour les victimes, toute notre solidarité avec les Ukrainiens, et restons bien entendu sous le choc des images effroyables qui viennent d'être diffusées dans la vidéo plus tôt ce matin. La France condamne avec la plus grande fermeté les exactions massives commises par les forces russes. Ces exactions pourraient être constitutives de crimes de guerre, mais aussi de crimes contre l'humanité. Les manœuvres de désinformation The utilisées par la Russie pour dissimuler ces crimes Russia ne surprennent malheureusement personne. No Une fois encore, Moscou ajoute Once à l'indignité du meurtre de civils et du massacre d'enfants, celle du mensonge, du cynisme et du négationnisme. Of, uh, Madame la Présidente, face à ces crimes denial. odieux, Madame Présidente, la France appelle à ne pas céder à la haine et appelle à agir autour de plusieurs axes. Premièrement, il nous faut maintenir une pression la plus forte possible pour contraindre les autorités russes à mettre fin à une guerre qui ébranle la sécurité mondiale, comme ça a été discuté bien au-delà de l'Europe, notamment la sécurité alimentaire. La France reste totalement engagée pour y contribuer, notamment avec ses partenaires européens, dans le cadre de la présidence française du Conseil de l'Union européenne, ainsi que dans le G7. Elle poursuivra aussi son appui déterminé aux autorités ukrainiennes toutes ses forces. Deuxièmement, les crimes commis en Ukraine ne doivent pas rester impunis. Les enquêtes crédibles, indépendantes, doivent être menées afin de permettre aux juridictions nationales et internationales compétentes de juger les responsables de ces atrocités. Nous appelons en particulier la Russie comme l'Ukraine à coopérer pleinement avec la Cour pénale internationale et avec la commission d'enquête établie par le Conseil. The commission of inquiry is set up by the human Madame la Présidente, la Russie poursuit avec détermination et avec méthode sa guerre en Ukraine avec son lot de destruction et de souffrance indescriptible. Nous appelons au respect du droit international humanitaire. Les civils, y compris les enfants et les personnels humanitaires, doivent être protégés. Il en est de même pour les infrastructures civiles, notamment les hôpitaux, les écoles. Nous saluons la mobilisation des pays frontaliers de l'Ukraine, qui jouent un rôle absolument majeur dans la guerre des réfugiés. L'hospitalité dont ils font preuve, c'est de leur adoration. The European Union has in particular mobilized a package of over 500 million euros of urgent support to the Ukraine, and the European Council that took place on the 24th and 25th of March also is planning to set up a trust fund of solidarity for the Ukraine. France has also contributed 100 million of humanitarian assistance. We support the efforts of Secretary General Martin Griffith to achieve a humanitarian ceasefire to allow the evacuation of civilians from besieged. Cities and to ensure access to humanitarian assistance. All efforts should be made in order to achieve a cessation of hostilities. This is an initial stage towards a lasting solution of the conflict, and it's necessary for the credibility of the Russian involvement in negotiations. France is determined to continue to contribute to efforts of peace, in particular by supporting Ukrainian authorities in seeking a political solution once the ceasefire is achieved, as well as by maintaining that channel. Of dialogue with Russia. Madam President, as the French Minister of Europe and Foreign Affairs recalled on the 3rd of April, France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with Russia. France is fully engaged in the negotiations with
and for the heroic fight the President, the Ukrainian government, and the Ukrainian people are engaged in for your country and for the peace and freedom of us all. We are with you and we support you. As we heard from President Zelensky and have seen this weekend, the need for peace could not be more urgent. For more than 40 days and nights, attacks from Russia have continued to batter the Ukrainian people and their cities, causing death and destruction. And the suffering is escalating. We too are appalled by the reports coming out of the areas around Kyiv and other regions. We are deeply shocked by the atrocities committed against civilians in places that has been held by the Russian forces, including Butcher. The images are distressing. Dead bodies on the roads and in mass graves. Homes, schools, hospitals and other civilian infrastructure destroyed and reportedly left behind. President, Russia is desperate to hide the truth about the war, but atrocities must be investigated and those responsible must be brought to justice. In this respect, we welcome the establishment by the Human Rights Council of a Commission of Inquiry on Ukraine to investigate all alleged violations of international humanitarian law and human rights law. And we also welcome that the ICC has opened an investigation into the situation in Ukraine. We urge Russia and everyone holding evidence to fully cooperate with these investigations. We cannot allow there to be impunity for war crimes being committed in Ukraine. The world is watching. President, Russia's unprovoked and illegal war against Ukraine, a free and sovereign country, is also an attack on democratic values and on freedom. It is a blatant violation of international law and the very principles of the UN Charter. And as the Secretary General underlined this morning, this Council has a responsibility. We must do everything in our power to end the war and to mitigate its impact. Let me repeat the message by the Norwegian Prime Minister Sture gave to President Putin when, he spoke, when they spoke on Thursday. He urged him to cease the hostilities and emphasize that Russia must ensure rapid, safe and unimpeded humanitarian access to the civilian population particularly in Mariupol. He stressed also the need to find a negotiated solution to end the war. President, the suffering is widespread. Russia's war is causing the largest humanitarian crisis in Europe since the Second World War. A quarter of the Ukrainian population has now been displaced. And cluster munitions will continue to maim and kill long after the conflict has ended. The reconstruction when it comes, will take years. Ukraine has been set back decades in its economic development, and the consequences of this war will be felt by generations of Ukrainians. Russia's war is also being felt globally, exacerbating other humanitarian crises and causing a serious negative effect on the agricultural sector with a global rise in food insecurity and increased prices of fuel and fertilizers. President, before concluding, let me be very clear. Much of Russia must abide by international law. It must comply with the order of the International Court of Justice to immediately suspend this military operation and to withdraw its troops from Ukraine. The killing and destruction must end. Russia must stop its illegal war. Thank you. The representative of Norway for her statement. And I now give the floor to the representative of Ghana. Thank you very much, Madam President. I congratulate the UAE for its successful presidency in the preceding month and wish you and the UK delegation the very best for this month. Let me begin by thanking Secretary General, the Secretary General for his statement to the Council and welcoming the briefings of USG Rosemary DiCarlo 
and USG and Emergency Relief Coordinator Martin Griffiths on the prevailing situation in Ukraine and the coordinated humanitarian response of the United Nations agencies in the face of difficult operational challenges on the ground. I also welcome the virtual participation in this meeting of the President of Ukraine, His Excellency, Mr. Volodymyr Zelensky. My delegation has taken careful note of the Ukrainian President's remark, noted his country's steadfast commitment to peace, and encouraged the path of dialogue and diplomacy in finding a settlement of this needless war. Madam President, the prolongation of the war in Ukraine continues to be a situation of deep concern for Ghana. We are particularly disturbed by the increasing humanitarian cost arising from the unjustified aggression by the Russian Federation against Ukraine. We have observed with pain the unbridled bombardment of civilian populated areas as well as civilian and other critical infrastructure without regard to the customary norms of international law and the principles of international humanitarian law relating to armed conflict. Ghana is gravely concerned by the reports of alleged gross violations of international humanitarian law and international criminal law since the onset of the invasion, including emerging reports and images of human rights violations and the killings of civilians in Mariupol, Shanihiv, Kharkiv, and areas on the outskirts of Kiev, such as Bucha. We support the call by the Secretary General for an independent, impartial, and thorough investigations to establish the facts, gather the evidence, and to hold all perpetrators of such atrocious crimes accountable for their actions. The killing of children, the aged, medical personnel, humanitarian workers, and journalists are deplorable and we condemn all such acts unreservedly. We urge restraint on all sides and re-emphasize the urgency of an unconditional cessation of hostilities nationwide to enable the evacuation and safe passage of civilians and facilitate the delivery of life-saving aid to the people in the cities that remain under siege. Humanitarian agencies require unobstructed access to rich people in need of food, water, and medicine and other critical supplies and all parties must guarantee such access. The ravages of both the global COVID-19 pandemic and the situation in Ukraine demo demonstrates the interconnectedness and interdependence of states and reinforce the need for a unified international response in support of the path of dialogue and diplomacy. Madam President, we have followed closely the direct negotiations between the conflicting parties and note the progress made in the forefront of consultations which took place in Istanbul on 29th of March 2022. To sustain the negotiations, we urge a restraint in the ongoing hostilities and a follow-through of the express commitments to resolve the security concerns of the parties. In furtherance of the efforts of the parties, the Council must at this time focus attention on supporting confidence-building measures that facilitate a negotiated settlement of the immediate conflict and the wider question of European security on the basis of international law and other internationally agreed frameworks. The convergence of the parties and the international community on these matters would be the only way to end the tensions, bridge the differences between the parties, and forge a unified position on the situation in Ukraine. I thank you for your kind attention. I thank the representative of Ghana for his statement, and I now give the floor to the representative of the United Arab Emirates. Thank you, Madam President, and I'd like to join others in congratulating you and your team for assuming uh, the presidency and wishing you a productive month. I'd also like to thank uh, the Secretary General, the Under Secretary General for Political and Peacebuilding Affairs, and the Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and the Emergency Relief Coordinator for their helpful briefings. We also thank President Zelensky for his address to this council. We have once again heard in this council deeply sobering and concerning reports from the ground, including from Martin Griffiths and Rosemary De Carlo. And with every meeting, the council is reminded of the rapidly deteriorating humanitarian situation on the ground in Ukraine. One quarter of the country's population have fled their homes. And the rising death toll and the destruction of critical civilian infrastructure are a grim reflection of the tragic human cost of war. The images coming out of Bucha and other towns and cities are shocking. The alleged crimes they entail are of the utmost gravity. 
And first and foremost, as others have said, we must establish what has happened here with the cooperation of all parties. It is imperative that we do not get caught up in a war of narratives in addition to the conflict that is ongoing. Indeed, we need to allow for the existing mechanisms to investigate the facts on the ground impartially so that justice for all victims can be served. And we acknowledge the Secretary General's call for that independent investigation, as well as last week's appointment of the members of the Human Rights Council's Independent International Commission of Inquiry on Ukraine. As we enter the sixth week of conflict, we believe that an immediate cessation of hostilities throughout Ukraine is imperative to move towards a peaceful solution to the war in Ukraine. And we take note of efforts to reach a diplomatic resolution to the conflict. And we see the ongoing negotiations and the several rounds of negotiations between Russia and Ukraine as a very positive development. We remain hopeful that these efforts at the negotiating table can urgently translate into de-escalation on the ground. And we urge others to support these efforts. We also welcome the readout from Mr. Griffiths on his meetings with senior Russian officials, as well as his upcoming meetings with Ukrainian officials. Establishing a viable humanitarian ceasefire could be a stepping stone for broader negotiations and eventually a sustainable peace. However, until a cessation of hostilities is achieved, the priority must be to work towards protecting and alleviating the suffering of civilians. And in addition to the points we made during the last Council meeting on Ukraine on 29th March, I want to focus here on four additional points for the Council's consideration. First, as others have done, we all need to continue to reaffirm uh, the need for all parties to abide by their obligations under international humanitarian law, in particular the protection of civilians and the respect for the principles of distinction and proportionality that are paramount in conflict. Second, the difficulties in providing relief and humanitarian access need to be addressed immediately and can be addressed quickly. It's critical to find either local or broad-based agreements for security guarantees to allow for the safe provision of humanitarian assistance and for civilians to voluntarily evacuate safely. And these are initial confidence-building measures that can be developed down the line and should also be encouraged, including the proposals left by Mr. Griffiths. Uh, with the government in Moscow. Third, as the ICRC has noted, false narratives and disinformation has the potential to cause real harm for humanitarian organizations on the ground. The use of digital technologies that amplify the spread of harmful information, including misinformation, disinformation, and hate speech, is a true challenge in conflict zones. And these phenomena are not new but technology has greatly increased the scale and speed at which harmful information reaches target audiences online. And this is particularly concerning in crisis settings where information can influence the dynamics and behavior on the ground and can put communities and humanitarian responders at risk. Fourth, at a time of conflict, protecting civilians, of course, must be our top priority. However, we should not forget the impact that war has on a nation's cultural heritage and identity. We're concerned by UNESCO's recent reports on the dozens of cultural sites that have been damaged in Ukraine since the conflict began. We know from our experience in the Middle East that protection of cultural sites is critical to rebuilding peace. And in moments of violence and turmoil, cultural sites are essential cornerstones for collective memory and a foundation for future reconciliation. We therefore call on all parties to refrain from the unlawful destruction of cultural heritage and to think about what comes next after the war concludes for the people living there and how they go about building peace. Before I end, allow me to take a moment to reflect on uh, what others have commented on, including the Secretary General, and that is the devastating impact of the conflict on food security worldwide. And we're alarmed by these figures shared by the Secretary General just now on how the war is affecting some of the most vulnerable communities around the world. 1.2 billion people in 47 developing countries are at risk due to rising food prices. And food shortages are aggravating situations already on this Council's agenda. And these shortages are felt in other settings where high prices of basic commodities can lead to further unrest and instability, not just in this part of the world, but around the globe. So we look forward to seeing the UN Global Crisis Response Group on Food, Energy and Finance address these issues and offer it our full support. 
And let us not forget that the effects of this war are hitting communities that are still reeling from the global COVID-19 pandemic. And these vulnerabilities are further exacerbated by reduced domestic food production uh, due to the rising costs and scarcity of chemical fertilizers and pesticides. And the knock-on effects, including global conflicts, will be grave and the Council must stay focused on all of them. Unless we do something to end this conflict now, it will continue to drive suffering and instability worldwide in the coming months and years, and the world simply cannot afford this, uh, and the Security Council should do its part to stop this conflict and to help parties come and reach a peaceful solution. Thank you. I thank the representative of the United Arab Emirates for her statement. And I will now make a statement in my capacity as the representative of the United Kingdom. President Zelensky, uh, by video, Secretary General, colleagues, the United Nations was created in the wake of a European war of aggression that laid waste to Europe and engulfed the world. All of us who signed the UN Charter committed to ending the scourge of war, to fundamental human rights, the dignity and worth of the human person, the equal rights of nations large and small, to justice and respect for international law. Yet now we're facing another war of aggression in Europe. We've heard today again the devastating impact of Russia's unilateral and illegal military action in Ukraine, its impact on surrounding countries and the region, and on the security and prosperity of the wider world as it seeks to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. Thousands killed, millions displaced, cities razed to the ground, hospitals bombed, citizens cut off from food, water and medicine, blockaded seaports and the rapid increase in wheat prices, pressure on already stretched humanitarian resources. And now, as Russia is forced into retreat from areas around Kyiv, the brutality of the invasion is laid bare. We've all seen the horrific images from the towns of Bucha and Erpin of civilians deliberately killed in areas from which Russian forces have we recently withdrawn. And the video we saw earlier underlined that horror. These acts and other credible incidents must be investigated as war crimes and the UK fully supports the work of the International Criminal Court and the work of the Ukrainian Prosecutor General and other national prosecutors. Colleagues, as we and so many others have said so many times, all of this could be stopped if the Russian Federation ended this war now. I resume my function as President of the Council. The representative of the Russian Federation has asked for the floor to make a further statement. Thank you, Madam President. I know that this does not bring us closer to the end of today's meeting, but since today's uh, topic is extremely important, I think it's uh, essential, essential to, to uh, say a few words about what was the reason for this meeting, which we didn't have a chance to say yesterday because we were not given a chance to have a separate meeting of the Security Council on this topic. And unfortunately, yesterday's meeting, um, in any way possible, our, Russian co our Western colleagues tried to, to kind of uh, sweep it under the carpet, and we have seen uh, an example of how uh, of the new order based, a uh, new rules based order. The rules based order. Uh, 
I would like to once again focus on the events in Bucha, which became the premise for conducting today's meeting, and has led to some far-reaching conclusions that many of you have already made. All units of the Russian armed forces fully withdrew from Bucha as a gesture of good faith on the 30th of March. The very next day after uh, a round of uh, negotiations between Russia and Ukraine in Turkey, in the presence of negotiators. Now, a uh, report about this was published that very same day on an official website of the Russian uh, Defense Ministry. During the time that this, the town was under the control of the Russian armed forces, not a single civilian suffered from any kind of violence. People were able to move around freely around the town and use their cell phones. Furthermore, the towns of the Kiev uh, oblast uh, uh, was the, the, Russian, the Russian army uh, supplied 450, 000, uh, 450 tons of humanitarian assistance to those cities. This was confirmed. Now, the, uh, the towns, the Russian army did not uh, prevent people from leaving the towns. All inhabitants could freely leave the, the towns uh, uh, toward the north. At the same time, the southern, uh, the southern areas of Bucha, including residential areas, were shelled round the clock by Ukrainian forces uh, from using uh, heavy uh, caliber weapons, tanks, and mortars. Already after the withdrawal of the Russian forces, the mayor of Bucha, Anatoly Fedorov, in his video statement on the 31st of March, presented this as a heroic liberation of the city by the Ukrainian armed forces. Now, uh, let's set aside uh, the so its so-called liberation. And let's focus on the fact, fact that he confirmed the fact on the 31st of March that it, there were no more Russian soldiers in the town on the 31st of March. Furthermore, the mayor did not mention any local inhabitants with their hands tied and uh, having been shot. I mean, could you believe that the mayor would not have noticed on the streets as... Uh, as reported of 280 corpses? On the 1st of April, the deputy of the council, Yekaterina Ukrainsova, the deputy of the council of Bucha, in a two-minute video, uh, warned it several times the local residents that representatives of the Ukrainian security forces have entered the town and are conducting a mop-up operation. And she is ask, she's asking everyone to be very careful. Now, in, on social media, you can also find an almost eight-minute video about the announced mop-up of Bucha by the Ukrainian National Police on the 2nd of April. On that video, there are no bodies of civilians on the street. Furthermore, on that video, the National Guard of Ukraine also interviews local residents who uh, didn't mention any uh, corpses or, or, or mass shootings. And one of the Ukrainian news sites, there was also a warning posted on the upcoming mop-up of Bucha on the 2nd of April from uh, uh, a mop-up of Russian uh, collaborators. Now that it's been deleted, but users were able to, to save that video. Now, testimony, so-called testimony of crimes, or evidence of crimes, by the Russian armed forces in Bucha appeared only on the 3rd of April, on the fourth day after the, uh, the Russian forces left the, the town. Once again, without any evidence based on the presumption of guilt, the Russian, the Russian army is being accused of some, some kind of evil deeds. Of course, we, 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 we could not notice how uh, the, the, these Ukrainian videos were taken up by Western media and human rights organizations with, who claim to be impartial. And clear, clear inconsistency between, uh, between the, the Ukrainian version and uh, the actual facts is clear.
людей действительно пролежали под открытым небом несколько дней, то них, несомненно, были бы соответствующие проявления, хорошо известные, известные специалисты по судебной медицине. Это наших западных коллег, похоже, совсем не смущает. Иначе бы Нью-Йорк Таймс не пошла еще дальше, утверждая, что трупы на улице пролежали аж с 20 марта. Вы можете представить, в каком Кроме того, многие погибшие на распространенных украинцами кадрах имели на руках опознавательные знаки, белую ленту. Такую же, как надевали мирные жители после прихода российских А на одном из выложенных украинскими радикалами в сеть видеороликов хорошо слышен призыв стрелять по всем, у кого нет синих ленточек на рукавах. To shoot against any, to shoot anyone who doesn't have blue arm uh, bands. Это видео ухода зачистки в Буче выложил в сеть один из лидеров так называемых территориальных батальонов, которые украинская власть бесконтрольно раздавала оружие. Кроме того. Уже упомянутый мной депутат городского совета Бучи, Катерина Украинцева, в интервью к Медузе, новостному, российскому новостному изданию Медузи, призналась, что российские войска при ней людей не расстреливают. В том же интервью она подтверждает, что в основных разрушениях виноваты украинские войска. моменты, разумеется, также остаются за скобками в подаче наших украинских и западных коллег. Зато президент Зеленский уже рассуждает о том, что все эти явно постановочные кадры из Бучи якобы дают украинцам моральное право на, я цитирую, нецивилизованный ответ. Ну, что это такое, мы можем только догадываться, well, we потому как вели себя украинские радикалы на востоке Украины. Многочисленные свидетельства их преступлений шокируют. К сожалению, похоже, на этом киевские специалисты по дезинформации и постановкам останавливаться не собираются. Заявили в Министерстве обороны России подтвержденные информации вечером 4 распространение через западные СМИ. Подобные мероприятия украинскими спецслужбами были проведены также в Сумах и некоторых других городах. В завершение, я хотел бы обратиться к нашим западным коллегам. Мы прекрасно понимаем, что вы делаете, разыгрывая украинскую карту и с каждым днем нагнетая истерическую антироссийскую пропагандистскую кампанию. Поэтому мы Поэтому мы предполагаем, что будут и дальше происходить новые мерзкие провокации по типу Буча. Новые попытки очернить российских солдат, представить их садистам, убийцам и я уже говорил, что это, это крайняя подлость. Правда, вас не интересует то, что сегодня современные технологии позволяют сделать любое видео. Мы сегодня посмотрели видео, которое нам представил украинская сторона. Сейчас уже интернет полон опровержением того, что мы там видим, что это было снято не там, не в то время. И ни с теми людьми. 
information refuting what was in the video there, stating that it wasn't filmed in the right place with not the right people. And just a few words to my American colleagues who uh, declared a crusade to, to exclude Russia from the Human Rights Council. This is stated by a, the representative of a country who three years ago criticized the Council in the, in the strongest, harshest terms that it осудить методы и действия американских солдат в Афганистане. That that it had the audacity of condemning the actions of American soldiers in Afghanistan. И как известно, Соединенные Штаты вышли из known the uh, United States left the council. Надеюсь, что наши коллеги по организации Объединенных Наций не дадут себя will собой not манипулировать uh, и не allow themselves to be Washington manipulated and, and play up to Washington and it's a very dangerous uh, uh, games. Thank you very much. I thank the representative of the Russian Federation for his statement. The representative of Ukraine has asked for the floor to make a further statement. Well, thank you, uh, Madam President. Before I switch to English, I would say a couple of words, a couple of lines, rather in Russian. Мы уже привыкли к вранью, которое постоянно выливается нам на головы в зале Совета Безопасности. Товарищ Небензя удосужился процитировать интервью decided to quote from an interview uh, from a uh, uh, media outlet called Medusa. I'd like to ask Comrade Medusa, uh, Comrade uh, Nebenza, excuse me, why he doesn't uh, quote the interview in full. Let me, let me quote that interview who the representative of Putin wanted to use for his purposes. Я цитирую. I'm quoting. Слова женщины, на которую он Бывало так, что российские солдаты передавали сухпайок в подвал, а потом кидали туда гранату. And then after, uh, after lowering these rations, they uh, tossed Вы хотели процитировать это интервью? You wanted to quote that interview. Why didn't you quote uh, the whole interview? This is about your humanitarian assistance, after which, uh, after you uh, provide that humanitarian assistance, you toss grenades. That's an interview from the same woman who you mentioned. Now let me switch to English. I would like to make my further statement in response to the hypocritical questions by Putin's representative. After the video we saw with the shocking images from Bucha, Irpin, Matejin, and other sites, he should ask these very questions to himself. How have Russians got to the cruelty of Nazis? When have you started enjoying acting like Nazis? Killing civilians, attempting to redraw internationally recognized borders, setting the task to finalize, finally resolve the Ukrainian issue like Hitler attempted to resolve the Jewish issue. When did you miss the point of Russia's turning into the Nazi-style cancerous tumor? Unable and unwilling to stop expanding and bringing to neighboring nations sufferings, destruction, pain, and death. I'm appalled over your cynical an outright lie that you don't hit civilian targets 
And that is why you are moving so slowly. You hit the civilian targets and you kill the civilians. Shall I quote your own words of yesterday in the press conference that you gave here in the headquarters, where you said that civilians are killed by your army? Or shall I not? Shall I play the video? You said it is a war. Civilians are killed in the war. It's a warfare, you said. Or perhaps uh, your mindset, in your mindset, a children's hospital in Mikolaev, destroyed by the Russian strike yesterday, was a military target. And perhaps a child killed as a result of the strike was a Ukrainian nationalist. The only truth you've said is that you are not moving as planned. And the only reason is the resistance of the Ukrainian army and the Ukrainian people, not your smart military planning. The Ukrainian people who realize quite clear what the Russian world in reality means. And we thank the international community for the solidarity with Ukraine. Ukraine will win in its territory. And the entire world will win, despite the threats that the criminal and the liar throws in the face just in the Security Council chamber. Finally, if there is anything that we have to thank the Russian representative for, it is his acknowledgement at the yesterday's press conference that Russia is waging war against Ukraine. War, you said several times, not the special operation. And I consider this confession shall impact the UN assessment of what is going on in the center of Europe. Perhaps it was the unique moment when we should believe what a fully accredited representative says in the United Nations. Hence, once again, a reminder to Putin's diplomats. Ribbentrop denied any knowledge of concentration camps, racial extermination policies, yet was found guilty at Nuremberg war crime trial. And we all know what happened to him on the 16th of October, 1946. I thank you. I thank the representative of Ukraine for his statement. I now give the floor to His Excellency, Mr. Olof Skug, the head of delegation of the European Union to the United Nations. Thank you, uh, Madam President. I address the Security Council on behalf of the European Union and its member states. North Macedonia, Montenegro and Albania, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Iceland and Liechtenstein, Republic of Moldova, Georgia, Monaco and San Marino all aligned themselves with this statement. And I wanted to start by congratulating you, uh, Madam, Madam Pre President for uh, the United Kingdom for assuming the presidency for the month of April and for convening this meeting and for inviting us to speak and also acknowledge the presidency of March of uh, the United Arab Emirates. I want to thank the Secretary General, the Under Secretary Generals Di Carlo and Griffiths for their uh, presentations and I want to express our full support, solidarity and respect for the heroic people of Ukraine as embodied by the message this morning by President Zelensky. Madam President, 41 days ago, Russia decided to wage a war of aggression against Ukraine in blatant violation of international law, the principles of the UN Charter and of the acquis of the OSCE, an affront to the rules-based order and to the global security and stability. And we have heard and seen again today the tremendous cost to the people of Ukraine. The dramatic consequences of Russia's war of choice are well known. Thousands of life have been, have been lost over 11 million people, most of them women and children, 
have been forced to leave their homes. Over 500 schools and 52 hospitals have been shelled. Entire cities have been razed to the ground. The unfolding drama in Mariupol and the images from Bucha stain our common humanity. Russia must stop this senseless act of violence. The EU condemns in the strongest terms Russia's unjustified and unprovoked war of aggression against Ukraine. We demand that Russia immediately stop its military aggression, immediately and unconditionally withdraw all forces from the entire territory of Ukraine, and fully respect Ukraine's territorial integrity, sovereignty, and independence within its internationally recognized borders, as demanded by the United Nations General Assembly. We condemn in the strongest possible terms the reported atrocities committed by the Russian armed forces in a number of occupied Ukrainian towns. Haunting images of massacres with large numbers of civilian deaths and casualties, as well as destruction of civilian infrastructure, show the true face of Russia's brutal war of aggression. These massacres will be inscribed in the list of atrocities committed by Russia on European soil. The Russian authorities are responsible for these crimes committed while they had effective control of the area. They are subject to the international law of occupation. Russia is directing attacks against the civilian population and is targeting civilian objects, including hospitals, medical facilities, schools and shelters. These war crimes must stop immediately. Those responsible will be held to account in accordance with international law. We welcome the International Court of Justice's provisional measures ordering Russia to suspend military operations immediately. We fully support the investigation launched by the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court into war crimes and crimes against humanity, as well as the work of the Independent Commission of Inquiry. The EU is assisting the Ukrainian Prosecutor General and civil society in the collection and preservation of evidence of the war crimes. It is clear there must be and there will be accountability. The EU and its member states are providing shelter for the more than 4 million refugees that fled Russia's violence. They do so regardless of nationality, ethnicity, religion or race. We have adopted sanctions against the Russian government, its financial and defense sectors and those individuals enabling and financing the aggression. We have committed significant funding to the UN humanitarian flash appeal and regional refugee response plans for Ukraine. So far, the EU and its member states have mobilized over 1.1 billion euros in emergency aid. This comes on top of the 2.4 million euros in humanitarian emergency and early recovery assistance the EU and its member states have provided to Ukraine since 2014. In the largest ever operation under the EU civil protection mechanism, 29 countries, all EU member states together with Norway and Turkey, have responded to the request for assistance from Ukraine. As of 4th of April, over 13,000 tons of medicines, hospital equipment, ambulances and firefighter equipment, food and energy supplies have arrived in Ukraine. European leaders have set up a Ukraine Solidarity Trust Fund to channel support to post-war post reconstruction. And at the pledging event on 9th of April with Canada, we will further showcase that we stand in words and deeds with the courageous people of Ukraine. Madam President, after the Security Council was un unable to take action, the General Assembly demonstrated once again less than two weeks ago the overwhelming international rejection of the Russian aggression and an overwhelming support to addressing the humanitarian crisis in Ukraine. The international community demanded safe and unhindered passage for civil civilians fleeing violence as well as humanitarian access to those in need international humanitarian law must be respected. The dramatic consequences of Russia's war against Ukraine are not limited to Europe. They are global. Ukrainian farmers are prevented from sowing as a result of Russian shelling. Ships filled with wheat and are blocked in Black Sea ports by Russian military forces. As a result, food prices have rocketed pushing people into poverty and threatening to destabilize entire regions. The poorest countries, as we've heard, are the most vulnerable to shocks in food prices. All this is a direct result of the war, despite Russia's cynical attempts to shift the blame. Madam President, the EU and its member states are fully mobilized to end the war in line with international law and the UN Charter. But at the same time, crises the world over need our urgent attention. 
the EU will continue to provide humanitarian and development support to our partner countries from North Africa to the Middle East and from Sub-Saharan Africa to Asia. We are scaling up our multilateral action to provide support to countries with acute food insecurity and are committed to keeping global trade routes op open so agricultural staples can feed the world. The EU has pledged 2.5 billion euros for international cooperation related to nutrition for the period 2021 to 2024. We also fully support the work of the UN to deliver and scaling up humanitarian assistance, protect refugees and work towards the ceasefire. With a particular focus on food security, we will contribute to the work of the Global Crisis Response Group to deal with the global social and economic effects of the war. We heard your recommendations this morning, Secretary General, and we have already launched a strategy for safeguarding food security and reinforcing the resilience of food systems backed by increased assistance. Madam President, once again, we call on Russia to cease the destruction of innocent life across Ukraine and immediately and unconditionally withdraw all its troops. We call for an immediate ceasefire, safe passage to civilians trapped in war zones and uninterrupted humanitarian access. We stand in solidarity with the people of Ukraine and all other people affected by the war of Russian aggression. We stand in support of Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity, and we will continue to work diligently with the UN and our partners to end this aggression and address the humanitarian needs. I thank you, Madam President. I thank His Excellency Mr. Skoog for his statement. I also acknowledge the written statement submitted by the delegation of Poland uh, in earlier before the meeting and also from the eight Nordic Baltic countries. There are no more names inscribed on the list of speakers. The meeting is adjourned. <laughs>